streaming, start recording. Happy, happy, happy. It says starting. I just heard a ding. Is that your audio? Or something? It could be the ding. All right, great. So um, let's see. I don't know. Should I point the camera at me for a second? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, please turn off the volume. Turn off all buzzers and everything else. <laughs> all your alive. We all have like multiple little thingies. So um <laughs> just waiting for everyone to turn their volume down so you can go. Hey, it's yours. Huh? Is that your volume? No. Mine's all off. Okay. Um Welcome everybody. Um, this is uh, Jason Pramus with Dig Boston and the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. And I'm here with a bunch of people I'm about to show you um, on this uh, YouTube live stream um, of the Jailbreak Conference um, that we're doing here in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts at the studios of Cambridge Community Television. And um, um, we're just going to get going with introductions first and then we're going to kind of work into um, you know the conference basics, but we're basically here to talk about um, corporate social media and its discontents as far as the news industry goes and you know um, kind of the way forward um, for uh, any possible democratic social media experiments and kind of changing the whole landscape for a lot of stuff. So um, let, let's just do some introductions and um, I'm going to start kind of aiming the camera at other folks. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we do Chris who's taking a nice. photo. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a uh, Chris Ferron. This is, uh, I am the um, editor of The Dig and uh, exec uh, editorial director of the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. I know most of you. Uh, and I guess, you know, this really is uh, Jason's show. Um, we, uh, you know, Jason manages the social media for, for both of those, primarily for The Dig. And I'm just kind of a cog caught in the system doing what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I've kind of like, a, those of you who follow me on Twitter know it's not exactly a bright feed, uh, but it's kind of like one of these things where uh, I, I use my personal I use my personal Twitter to push a lot of stuff, uh, and I find Facebook to just be insanely frustrating, and uh, I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure that's what we'll talk about a lot of today, but you know, for us, it's just like with the newspaper our size, with the dig, it's uh, you're really dead in the water with Facebook. You're either paying or you're, you know, it's almost like, why, why are we there? So we finally decided after... How many years of throwing a hundred dollars a week at Facebook? A couple, anyway. I mean, and before you know, before we took over, yeah. yeah. Awesome. yeah. Uh, and I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say, you know, I, over the years I've had tremendous success with Facebook too. When it was really different, when you used to be able to boost personal, um, personal posts, I raised tens of thousands of dollars like that. You know, when they took that away, Facebook pretty much got useless to me almost, almost right away. Well, this is about all corporate social media, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, which we're using. And yeah, yeah. For, well, that's the one that I really have. You know, Facebook's really yeah. what, what brought me to this point to have something like this. But really, I don't want to suck too much air out of the room. I'm really here to listen because I know that even as we were talking, asking people about this conference and, you know, people like, like Sam, for example, like uh, I know people already have things in the works, people talking about alternatives. So we're here to listen and then implement. Um, I'm Felicia Sullivan. I actually live in Lowell, Massachusetts. I am not currently affiliated really doing anything related to media, but for a long time I worked with the public access station in Lowell, worked in community radio in Lowell, um, ran a social change technology organization for a while, um, continue to see uh, media and technology for community-based purposes is really important. And right now I'm trying to start up something similar to Dig Boston, but on a much smaller scale in, in Lowell with folks there mm. because our local news sources suck. So, mm. you know, and, and, you know, I'm always looking for ways in which we can s circumvent and control our um, information and the uh, media and communications we put out there and that people have ultimate power over what they're communicating. Awesome. Yeah. And y'all can take your time introducing yourself. Yeah. We got a, up to a half hour here. So. Um, I'm Mickey Metz, and I work with a local and international web development cooperative, which means we own the company and we do the work. Um, we are based in Boston, Managua, Hamburg, and Minneapolis, and Denver right now. Um, we create websites as our uh, value of money flow or whatever like that, and we also engage in doing outreach 
um, to help people be aware of what tools are available, free software tools versus the corporate sponsored tools. Um, I guess one um, little saying that could bring it into focus is you can't create a movement for freedom built on someone's proprietary application. And if you think you can, <laughs> you have to see it. <laughs> um, so um, <coughs> we travel around, speak at conferences, and um, engage people in ideas about what would it look like if we owned our own software, what would we want in our software. And from that sprang a movement, um, from people just doing that in general, a movement called Platform Cooperatives has sprung up um, over four years from the new school. And it's, it's Platform Cooperativism, just at platform.coop. And it is a coalescence of a bunch of people, not all technologists, not all journalists, not all media. It's anyone, really, that has a, a use for a platform, which would be anyone. <laughs> and a platform is what I mean, like your electric company, your um, solar power, your um, just running things that run the infrastructure of your town. These need to be owned by the people, um, along with the Facebook thing. Um, but they're buried down under it. People don't really um, to consciously think of that. So we're trying to incorporate the whole gamut. And what would it look like if we, the people, owned the platforms of communication that we use? Well, uh, it looks. I think it would look a lot different. <laughs> and uh, to that um, call, there's been a group of technologists and others, because um, a technologist can't do anything alone. <laughs> Don't let them do anything yeah. alone. <laughs> get them away from the keyboard <laughs> and into a group. Um, but <laughs> so we have built um, an ecosphere, I guess, of uh, people that are building out these platforms right now. And it's at a site called the Internet of Ownership, IOO.coop. And you can see a list of softwares there that are in process of being built, that are already built and being used. Um, some are just a thought now, and um, people can get engaged through this website by contacting wow. people. Awesome. So it's, uh, it's just... Wow you know, blooming really nicely. Um, we put together a book. The two gentlemen who uh, organized the conference, uh, New School in New York, Trevor Schultz and Nathan Schneider, both um, edited a book and there's 35 authors. I thankfully have a chapter in it, I don't know how, but <laughs> <laughs> writing on the backs of giants. And uh, it went to the top tech books of 2017 um, in Wired Magazine which is a good start. Title. It's called Hours to Hack and to Own. Mm. And it's um, a pretty interesting read because there's so many authors, you don't have to read it straight through. You can choose chapters that call to you or um, reference, you know, hey, Joe mm -hmm. needs to know about this <laughs> and get him that chapter. So um, that's pretty much what I do. I, I'm really totally grateful to the other members of my cooperative who make it possible for me to travel around and speak about these things and engage people in ideas of um, what if we owned it? And uh, well, we do, <laughs> here it is, mm -hmm. take a look. Um, I also have brought a couple of sticks with me. Do any of the journalists in the room use tails? Nope. Do you encrypt any of your documents or anything? Sometimes. <laughs> 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 Have you heard of tails? Yeah, we were working on that on something. Okay. Great. I brought uh, a couple okay. of sticks if anyone would like to try taking tails home with them and uh, see how it works for you. Basically, you c it's the operating system is on your little stick. You can go and it's encrypted by the Tor browser, Tor router system. You can do your work and the FBI guy comes over and says, what are you doing? You pull the stick out and everything is gone. If you want to save it, you have another stick that you're saving to, mm -hmm. and then that's your liability. <laughs> wow. But um, and it's we have you to thank for the pizza as well. Oh, yeah, <laughs> pizza is much. incidental. <laughs> People need food for their we brains to it. work. <laughs> really. it's, that's, it's not good to be at a conference where you're like really hungry and thinking of <laughs> dinner instead of <laughs> the subject. So that's me. Cool. Um, my name is James O'Keefe. I go by Jamie. I'm. Uh, captain of the Massachusetts Pirate Party. Um, we run a variety of things. Um, 
we teach people how to protect their privacy, we run candidates, we engage in different activities. Um, we worked with other groups to come up with the first crypto party in Massachusetts, as far as we know, back a bunch of years back, and um, have been working with folks out of the Somerville or Boston crypto party to have trainings where people can learn how to protect their privacy online to use things like Tails or Tor uh, or encrypt their email or use Signal or things like that. Um, we recently did one with the Museum of Science uh, to help, they had like almost 60 people there and we taught them how to use Signal, we taught them how to choose good passwords and use password managers, use Tor and virtual private networks and, and uh, <coughs> get off of Facebook. Um, so as I said, we run candidates. We run candidates for a state representative uh, a couple of times, twice in Somerville. Uh, the current incumbent in that particular district had never had a competitor until we came along uh, two elections in a row and uh, actually run someone against her. Um, additionally, of late, we've been active in helping to, with the net neutrality, FCC's net neutrality decision and the uh, privacy um, decision they had. Uh, we've been building a uh, community mesh network. Uh, basically, it's kind of an internet service provider that is controlled by the people who provide access to the internet through routers, such that all the routers talk to one another and um, or talk to their neighbors and can route Route, uh, route internet traffic from one place to the other so that you don't have to go through Comcast or RCN or whatever your local uh, semi-monopolist internet service provider is. And so we've gotten hardware working. Uh, we're, uh, MassMesh.org is uh, you know, the tech meeting once a, once a week. Once we get the hardware up and running, then people can go get some commodity software, we can help them get set up, and then we go from there and building an alternative to the Comcast of the world. So, you know, we, we do political, and mm -hmm. we do teaching, and uh, we do action. So, if anyone's interested, you can find us at uh, masspirates.org. Uh, I'm Matt Lee. Um, Currently, I'm an engineering manager at the Guardian project. That's very new. Um, we make Tor for Android and other tools. I'm working on a thing called the Open Archive, which is a tool for sharing stuff, um, uh, pictures and video files from your phone over Tor, over a mesh network, over Bluetooth, um, all encrypted to the Internet Archive. Uh, in a previous life, I started this thing called GNU Social, which became the kind of basis of the federated network that people now think of as Mastodon. Um, and yeah, 20 years of free software and web activism and stuff. I have still my, my, my pocket, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me, I guess. And uh, Matt L on Twitter, I guess, yeah. where I talk about everything all the time. I'm currently at a royal wedding, so uh, I'm not here right now. Right, <laughs> this is a hologram. <laughs> yeah, I'm at Slower, I'm at Slower, uh, right now. So you're there with Alexis from our Reddit. Uh, Jay, I guess? Uh, hey everyone, I'm Jay Neely. Uh, I've spent the last 10 years being a community builder in Boston's uh, tech startup scene primarily. And now I'm starting to explore how to build a stronger <laughs> media business community in Boston. Um, I'm here today with a web development and marketing background and just here to listen. Uh, media companies reclaiming ownership of the means of distribution <coughs> is one of those essential things for their future and something that I'm super passionate about. So that plus the audience development component of just use of social in general, two of the things I'm hoping to hear a lot about today. Hi, um, I'm Cara Peterson. I'm one half of the founders of Post With Me. Um, and you can guess which one of us is the technologist by which tools we're using to take notes. <laughs> so um, I'm not the technologist. So I have a background um, in nonprofit journalism myself, but currently I'm working Aside with Post With Me, I'm working in the public health space. And so where the, we came at this was seeing what social media is actually doing to our society. So it's more than just journalism from where we're coming from. 
Uh, we work on gun violence, we work on the opioid crisis, we work on refugees, we work on all kinds of things like that. So we've seen what uh, this is doing to our society. Now there are good things coming from social media like Parkland students, et cetera, but we think it's really a negative space for us and we want to reclaim a lot of what we're doing um, with each other as human beings in a more positive and civil way. So, and here's the text side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Richard Devona and I co-founded Post with me with Kara. Originally, the idea was that um, we're just not pleased with social media, but more from a civilian standpoint than a journalism standpoint, with the nastiness and the and the hatred and the manipulation and all of that. So, um, I built this site originally just as a kind of <coughs> Facebook Reddit type alternative where where <coughs> anybody could go on and post their thoughts long or short form and and um, there's strong community standards that we enforce and it's just kind of open to all but we have some ideas about how to kind of help maybe um, other types of content providers journalists <coughs> get their work out there yeah and what really got us interested we're married so that's why i interrupted him but um, <laughs> <laughs> one, one, uh, one thing that got us really interested in this space and very excited to be here um, was the whole debacle with Medium. Um, so that really got us thinking. We saw what you guys were posting on um, on Twitter, and yeah. the wheels have been turning really, really fast. So um, yeah, we've done a few startups in our day, so we're, we're excited. This, for those who don't, this is this is the, the of the many headlines about it. This was my favorite. Read it up. Medium the keeps killing off blogs in the name of saving the internet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, I'm Sam Patricus. Um, Emma and I um, run Boston Hassle, which is um, it's pretty much uh, it's like a multifaceted arts organization. We actually became a 501c3 a few years ago, <coughs> but it started in around 2008, 2009 when we started organizing shows, and we kind of grew our collective. But primarily, yeah, we're an art, music, and film like. Um, platform, you know, promotion company for like independent and DIY artists. Um, we publish a newspaper, a monthly newspaper uh, called Boston Compass and kind of bostonhassle.com is our kind of the blog, the endless uh, blog version of our newspaper. Um, and so, I mean, we got interested in this. We're so excited to be here. This is incredible. Um, we got interested in this a few years ago when pretty much around, Chris was mentioning earlier, I don't know if it was before we started, but um, where the kind of published or the promoted posts kind of started to be restricted more and more and like they wouldn't let me invite people to events and stuff. Um, so we organize events as well as promote them. So we promote like the community at large and then we have our own. So we kind of have this like stake in like the events especially. Tell them how many you do. Um, we do like usually about 150 events a year. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all on the backs of no, uh, volunteers. No one's mm -hmm. paid in our organization. Um, there's about 200 volunteers. Some of us just, you know, distribute newspapers and some of us write for blogs and some of us run the shows. Um, so anyway, we do all this and a couple of years ago we were just frustrated with Facebook so we started this sort of campaign uh, that we nicknamed Post Facebook, um, mm -hmm. like imagining a world where Facebook mm -hmm. is over. And I truly believe that it is. Like I think this is great that we're doing this and we need something to take its place. But um, you know, we work a lot with teenagers and the teens are not using Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, so I, I think we're in a good place. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we kind of launched this campaign to kind of collect, like our idea was to have dozens of alternatives to Facebook, including, I mean, all of your, your voices represent like things beyond this, but we just thought of like text messaging apps and like obviously putting flyers out there, the newspaper itself, um, you know, physical things, but then also blogs and creating networks of blogs. Anyway, we had this list and it was called Post Facebook, but the volunteers that were running it just kind of stopped doing it. so it. We started it, we launched it, and we have alternatives number one and two can be found on our website. Um, one is just like Google Calendar. You know, you can list events on Google Calendar and you know, it doesn't restrict who sees it, et cetera. Um, but, so we have these things kind of in the works, but um, I don't know, I'm excited to finally, hopefully these things will come to fruition with like collaborating with the likes of all of you. So, cool. anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much for organizing this, it's awesome. Um, I'm Emma, I designed the Boston Compass and just help out with a lot of the Boston Hassle programming. Um, and yeah, I just, I see us like, first and foremost, as just like community building, like around the arts. And I just find it really ironic that Facebook's trying to like, come up with ideas of how we can use Facebook to like, you know, make us not so isolated and depressed all the time, but like, 
really they should be supporting like the arts organizers who are people who really bring people together and give them a sense of like why they're alive. Um, <laughs> but instead they're like, let's work on virtual reality so you can have someone, a virtual person sitting across from you having coffee instead. Like, and I'm just like, this is so backwards and wrong. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to be here and like just build with everyone and like we're connected to a lot of arts communities in Boston and, and that just keeps growing. So. We want to bring this to them and like empower them to, to do shit differently. Hi, I'm Chris Thompson. Uh, I work uh, with Mickey as, as part of the gag. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm a developer slash uh, sysadmin kind of person. And I really came along because I, I spend a lot of time uh, looking at you know software solutions, free software. Um, that is um, that's focused on you know working cooperatively or working with uh, platform cooperative movement and giving control to the people that actually you know contribute to the platform or whose resources are shared on the platform <coughs> or whatever. So like you know one of the easiest ways of describing the whole platform cooperativist thing is it it's essentially like an Uber owned by the drivers. Um, you know so so building those sorts of platforms, um, sharing what little I know, and also about, um, you know, I don't know much about uh, journalism per se, but in terms of publishing things, there are movements like, um, there's, you know, micro formats from the Indie Web Camp um, that help tag your content on, yeah. on in various places so that, um, you know, you're, it identifies the authorship and all kinds of points back to your to where your uh, profile lives and you know just kind of makes a lot of the links for um, a lot of the links in publishing um, to sort of bring a standard approach to um, <coughs> to it without really defining the tools um, not the best description but uh, <laughs> an idea about it um, probably the best place to look at it is um, the there's a platform called Gnome um, and also a blogging. Okay, I know that yep. Uh, and also a a, um, a partner site with known. Um, you know what the URL is? Uh, well, possibly look for. That's with it right there. With known. Yep. With known. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, and and that's a that's another publishing platform that uses a lot of these indie web uh, micro formats. You know, implements a lot of them and stuff. Um, so yeah, you know, little things like that and um, things about, uh, you know, Mastodon or GNU Social, you know, those types of platforms that are able to cross communicate and build a larger ecosystem of, of social interaction, um, you know, that aren't even, ju aren't even just, you know, micro, um, micro blogging, but could also be media or whatever, like Media Goblin can also talk kind of the same, um, the, the same protocol between servers so that you can still have cross communication between mm -hmm. someone's equivalent of uh, Flickr or whatever and, you know, um, and another feed. Um, so yeah, just to kind of describe the Fediverse really quick in terms of the way it communicates, it's probably easiest to just think of the way, the way that email works, you know. Anybody can have their own email account at whatever domain and you know, with it within the Fediverse, you can have your account at whatever hosting service, you know, so some Mastodon instance or GNU social instance or whatever. So, um, so you're that user at that instance and can subscribe to people on other instances with their full, you know, address as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm yeah, <laughs> just a journalist. I'm <laughs> Orbiting moons of binge in the day, uh, cover politics, cannabis, culture, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. so I have nothing to offer. That's not, <laughs> no, 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 it's, you know, cannabis is a big issue for it us. It is. It's a huge thing for us, and there's no, you know, we've, we've, we've had to fight with different email services and mm -hmm. Facebook, and forget it, you know. Mm -hmm. And we love smoking. <laughs> <laughs> we always uh, I'm Greg Hausch. Uh, I might have helped found Anonymous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who can say? Uh, might have been there to help get Occupy off the ground um, with the <coughs> millions of followers we happen to have uh, to get the media to cover it and get it moving. 
and then to come back here and get uh, Boston's Occupy up as the second one so we could show the world that everyone needed to occupy instead of just, uh, just New York. Through all of that, uh, through the anonymous stuff especially, um, putting up the message to Scientology video with millions of views, Scientology got really angry with me. Spent millions of dollars to hunt me down and <coughs> put my name online once they found out who I was. And uh, then this guy over here did the first live interview with me. <laughs> and I ended up being an interview subject for <coughs> thousands of articles, TV shows, just everything you can imagine, which led me into journalism and led me into, you know, what I saw was really wrong with it, for one. And I attempted my hand at lots of journalism, from running my own to putting articles in other uh, places, The Guardian, New York Times, all those types of places. Didn't really enjoy any of that process, and uh, ended up starting my own podcast. And we're doing decent right now. We're up at about 12,000 uh, listeners, and um, we get most of them through Facebook. <laughs> and I would love other methods to actually get our listeners. Um, I'm sick of that platform, and if you look at all my personal stuff, even though I'm sitting there with the thousands to some accounts, millions of followers on everything. I think I've posted three times on social media in six months now. I gave up a little while ago and just, I'm not anymore. So I would love other platforms that would get me interested in doing that again. Uh, I'm Anna Jeffrey, I'm with this guy. Um, in addition to all that nonsense, uh, over the last year, I've gotten really heavily involved with sort of traditional political groups. I'm you know, with uh, Invisible Mystic Valley and Our Revolution Malden, uh, but we're also part of a much smaller uh, nonprofit called Don't Miss Alone, just trying to help things like Democratic City Committees and like very old stodgy environmentalist groups and all these other things to uh, get their web presence caught up. So I'm dealing with people who are literally just getting their Twitters up this year, which uh, is not great. And so finding ways to help them not only catch up with where everybody was 10 years ago, but maybe give them tools for like, and here's how you can try to leapfrog <laughs> would be great. And I'm Mark Levy. I run a news website called Cambridge Day, which covers Cambridge and Somerville points of information. And uh, it was long ago formed as sort of a learning lab for how to do hyperlocal <coughs> journalism better. And I did have some initial thoughts along these lines some years back. Um, I think they sort of stalled, and uh, I'm sure that what will come out of today will be uh, much more amazing. But I think there's a lot of people who are eager for something that gets them off Facebook. Um, my name is Rachel Jans Boriskin, and I'm a professor at Simmons College uh, in the new Glen Eiffel College of Media, Arts, and Humanities. Yeah. Right? Um, and been working uh, with Lauren Saunders there in the Library and Information Science School, looking at ways for libraries to be um, hubs for local journalism, um, particularly in, in news deserts. And um, spent a lot of time teaching undergraduates turns out social media use with them um, and privacy and concern for them around activism and what they're not doing to protect themselves and, and others uh, in that. And then I blog occasionally at um, Politics in Pink, my site. Very fun. Um, cool. Uh, I'm Jane Regan, and my day job is that I'm a professor of journalism at BU, um, but just, you know, recently, um, and I just have a long history of doing radical and alternative media and, um, and community media, maybe just sort of progressive, you know, depending on the, what, what's toler tolerated um, in the U.S., but also in Haiti for many years. Um, I hate <laughs> Facebook. I, and I'm only on it because I have to understand it. I hate Twitter for the same reason. Um, and I've been teaching media and news literacy actually since <coughs> 2000. So I came, and I'm also trying to help some people in Somerville who I want them to be in touch with Binge. They're trying to found something like uh, what somebody else mentioned, but it's called the Somerville Free Press. Um, and so I'm interested in, I think it's, ex it's fantastic that you guys convened this. And I'm interested in like everything that everyone in this room is doing, and I'm just I'm here to learn. Um, Great crew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I'm also involved with some media outlets and some organizing in Haiti, and I'm also a member of our Revolution Somerville and some other organizations. Yeah. 
My name's Marisa Figueredo. I'm a binge and dig supporter. I'm hearing about the analysis that's starting today officially on critiques of Facebook and alternatives. I'm very interested, but since the early 80s, I have been in red stockings of the women's liberation movement, which is an organization that was founded in 69. And we have had serious problems with Facebook where we cannot use it to get the archive gems out there as a think tank. And we've always believed that a movement for liberation needs its own media and that that should be controlled by the organizations that are building those movements. We were very inspired by Occupy. So I'm here to learn too. And we have Saul. Hi, I'm Saul Hannenbaum. I'm sorry I'm late. And, um, I wear so many hats, I'm not even sure where to begin. Um, I'm on the binge board. I've done citizen journalism for CCTV. I blog about Boston and Cambridge um, in terms of politics and technology. Um, and what's been occupying most of my time recently is an organization called Upgrade Cambridge. Um, the uh, grassroots organization that seeks to persuade the city to build municipal broadband. Um, something that has wide support except from our city manager. Yeah, except from <laughs> city <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And for those of you who, let me, I'll turn this back to myself. So let's talk for a second. Oh, no. no, no, no. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, everyone. In the live stream uh, <laughs> this is really high tech in some ways and not so much in others. Yeah. Um, the city manager in Cambridge, our Plan E style of government here, um, basically controls all, and the city council and others be damned. But we'll, we'll hopefully work through that with the help of Upgrade Cambridge on the mini broadband stuff. So uh, yeah, again, I'm Jason Framus. I'm uh, executive editor and associate publisher of Dig Boston, uh, which is Boston's sole alternative news weekly now, uh, in print and everything, as well as online. And I'm the network director of the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. Uh, which is, uh, Chris, what do we say, binges? Binges? A convener. Ooh. <laughs> we, we actually have a really cool, uh, on our Medium page, we have a... <laughs> 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 it's a big actually, commercial now. So. Well, I actually had a, we had a, a, a funder say, your description of yourself is terrible, it should be this, and, and I literally just cut and pasted it out of the material. <laughs> okay. Bo so we are boosters and uh, producers <laughs> of independent media and journalists in mass and beyond. So we work with, uh, you know, we've done... We've done uh, more than 50 features at this point, and yeah. so roughly about half of those are first-time long-form feature writers. Yeah. But we also work with some, you know, uh, uh, established journalists, and then we have a whole bunch of relationships, including the one I'll mention is right here with CCTV, yep. and se multi uh, several other. Massachusetts has more than 300 cable access stations, mm -hmm. way more than any other state in the country, and uh, we found out that they don't really communicate very well with each other. So we do a show called Beyond Boston that uh, basically takes uh, some of the best packages from places all around here, Somerville, Brookline, Malden, uh, uh, Cambridge, sometimes Boston, sometimes some other places. And then they also uh, run this, these, uh, uh, the show Beyond Boston. They call it bicycling. Um, I was part of the founding. There you basically. go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's right. Yeah, with I a digital that. bicycle, yeah. And, yeah so, <laughs> you know, digital know, bicycle. And it's really, it's, really it's, it's actually, it's definitely germane because it's really, um, you know, it's a great way. Of, they they had they had the they had the um, capability of sharing information, but they yeah. weren't doing. It. Yeah, and I mean, I sorry, quickly describe binge as an investigative oops, investigative reporting incubator is is another way to look at it, or a wire service, and we, we pro provide a bunch of services, and we've been around since 2015 now. It's been a while, three years, and uh, uh, Chris and I and our, our other partner John um, have controlled uh, Dig Boston. We took it over last June, so it's been almost a year now uh, that we've been running the paper. So we're kind of in this unique position of having a hybrid organization, you know, which I jokingly call, what is it, the, uh, the Greater Dig Binge Mediaplex or whatever. So, you know, <laughs> and um, it, like so many others, we're obviously trying to figure out how to fund um, what, we, what we believe to be good news. Right in the interest of democracy, you know, if, and I, I said this. Some of you were in another event where I just said this recently, but you know, if, if engaged citizens and residents in this in this country, um, you know, want to be able to um, know what's going on, so they can, um, you know, be politically informed and act on it, and also culturally, socially, and every other way, you need a good independent press. And 
Um, as channels of distribution have changed, you know, over now, uh, for a lot of people, especially younger people, to, to different kinds of digital media, um, it's very important that we have access to these distribution channels and that we have, you know, some ability to know who our own audience is and to communicate with them. And this is the central problem that, that brought us, you know, to doing this event today, you know, is, you know, we've, it's a problem for the news industry, yes, but it's a problem for democracy in general, right, democratic communication. How can, you know, how can these news publications who play this important role in democracy um, reach and communicate in two-way fashion with our public at all times and know who they are um, and not have these basically large, you know, giant corporations, multinationals now, controlling the commanding heights of this digital media sector and sort of shaping the structure of it for their own ends, which are to make profit off of um, people's activity online, even stuff that they don't put online, stuff that they start typing, even uh, using predictive algorithms to figure out what people want to do next, whether they've done it or not, and what people offline are doing. You know, this has come to be called surveillance capitalism, right? These giant companies are like basically, uh, you know, amassing massive amounts of data, monetizing the data, and then figuring out ways to predict how to monetize it even better. And in doing so, they're making people addicts, right? This has been much written about, you know, we're all, all of us, including me, you know, constantly checking our phones, constantly checking our phones or whatever now. Um, but we, we have very little say in how the structures of this digital media functions anymore. <clears throat> Earlier on, certainly those of us that were around, I mean, I'm 51, you know, who were around for the early, you know, kind of internet, the early web, you know, the promise was that it was gonna be very horizontal, very democratic, and that we were all gonna have control of our data. Um, although we all knew that the military industrial complex built the apparatus we were using. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we got that, right? <laughs> but a lot of the scientists and engineers that worked on that original internet and stuff were basically cool, and they were, they were trying to do cool stuff. Um, they developed ways to communicate with each other, and then they decided to open it up as best they could to everybody else. So, you know, how do we get back to um, <clears throat> an internet that we all have a say, you know, in terms of how it runs? And where we control our data, we have privacy if we want it, and we can be open to the world if we if we want to do that. Um, and then for the news industry, you know, yeah, how do we? What platforms can we either reform or build where we can talk to our audience in an open way, know who they are, um, and um, be able to build communities together that that are lasting and meaningful. Um, so that's that's yeah, why we wanted to continue well here today. So we have um, some discussants, you know, among you that, that, you know, I asked to sort of speak first, essentially, right? And then, you know, we're just going to open it up after they kind of um, expand upon their initial remarks, essentially. So, yes. Can I, sorry, is, this, is it okay to ask a question? Or yeah, I mean, there's only 20, 20 yeah, okay. so, <laughs> so you said, you said know who they are twice. And so the question is, is, like, how do you do that and still keep the data privacy? Yeah, well, I mean, no, could knowing who they are could just be their their avatar, or their handle. Oh, or yeah. It's not like I mean, we're not like that crazy about it, but like, but we do like we are also the news industry is trying to fund itself, as I said, right? Both nonprofit operations, which are kind of a newer phenomena, that I I helped you know um, kick off like ten years ago with Open Media Boston when I started that. That's the project that I did before this, which was a nonprofit news outlet, um, and also you know for profit operations. Um, are trying to run off of advertising, yeah. But you know, there's a big difference between sort of display advertising that's kind of there, or even earlier broadcast advertising, which was annoying, but it wasn't as invasive as it is now, where you're really not clear what is an ad, what is not, you know? Uh, what kind of information am I giving these people without knowing it, right? You just click on something and then it turns out, like as we heard with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, you know, Facebook is handing stuff, all kinds of information to companies like that you know, basically intelligence agencies, private intelligence agencies, um, through these APIs that they, that they have for different, uh, different um, groups and software, you know, companies and stuff to be able to like interact with Facebook. They were getting handed a lot of free data about people that ended up having political consequences, like direct political consequences in terms of our last presidential election, but also lots of other countries as well. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. So the discussants are uh, Felicia, Mickey, Matt, Greg, and who am I skipping? I feel like I'm skipping someone. If not, you know, we'll just start with those folks and then just get going. Um, so Felicia, why don't you kick it off and yeah, I'll point so the camera I, you. know, in some ways, uh, I don't have a lot of like deep thoughts, but I, I, I am, what, 
And I have lots of questions, probably as much <laughs> as everybody else here. Um, I will say, you know, the thing uh, that I think we probably all share in common is that we either have a very a strong place-based or community-based interest, and so we're serving a, a group, a community. And for me, that's the, uh, you know, <coughs> I've lived in Lowell for over 20 years now. I love it. It's the place I'm at. It's the people I'm connected to. And it's the people I want to serve. And so the, the, the place can be a physical place, but it can also be a community of interest as well. Um, and I'm very <coughs> attuned to the idea that you need trusted agents in those spaces who know the community and connected to the community. And one would hope the media is part of that. It's not really is in many instances. So like how, you know, like I'm very interested in um, for a long time, I was, I was associated with the public access station there in Lowell, and so like I really love that space because it was like a kind of, I love that who was talking about libraries, I just love that idea of these very few public spaces where people can come and anybody can come, and they're not membership really <coughs> super, anyone can be a member, and there's so few public spaces like that. Um, and so that's the other thing, like how do you create spaces, <coughs> but they also have trusted agents in those spaces. Um, and then if you connect enough of us together um, in these spaces, you know, the trusted agents in Lowell, in Somerville, in Boston, and then beyond. Um, so the idea of the federated, as, as we're talking about, the federated platforms or the way in which you build relationships across these local entities or these communities, I think is the, is the key. And then I start to then think about, um, you know, my time, I used to run this organization called Organizers Collaborative, which did sort of social change tech, working with free and open source software platforms, and, and I agree with you, uh, don't just let the techs go do whatever. <laughs> Connect them to people, and to issues, <laughs> and to the real world, and to like purpose. Um, but then, you know, how do we also create those, those <coughs> systems? And it's not so much maybe the platform, but what is, what's the code, what's the protocols, what, what is the thing that helps us move across our various places? And, and when I say protocols too, I, it's not just the hardware and software, it's also the social system and the, and the norms. And th you were talking about civility or you know, like what is our code of conduct and what is our way of interacting with one another. And I, I sort of feel <coughs> like that's what we could build, that's what we could build. And so you create this system that's at once very complex, but very local very self-organizing, and but that there's some kind of shared, very rooted, community-based purpose to it, but we're all kind of sharing the thing that helps, it, which was the idealized internet. I, I, I'm about mm -hmm. your age too, Jason, and uh, you know, that idea that, mm -hmm. that promise of, of, <coughs> of the internet is that you could connect into it, anyone could connect into it. You had these very, you know, TCP IP was like this amazing thing, right? It, it really was like, a, like the constitution of the internet in a way, like mm -hmm. anyone could kind of connect in, but it just, we lost that cap capability to really connect in, and then as everyone was talking about the municipal broadband, so I'll, like the you know just folks who still don't have that access in, or the mesh networks. Folks were talking about the mesh networks too. So it's the it is the infrastructure, it's the software, it's the social relations, and the, so that's where I'm thinking. So that's I don't have much more to discuss than that, but like those are the thing, those are the elements, and they are how we do the work, but how we engage the people in the work. Um, so I don't know why cooperatives haven't been a more form of, of ownership that's present in our in our society. It's at once private and social, and it, I just, it's amazed to me that it's not a more <coughs> form of ownership. To me. It's a lot of reasons. <coughs> yeah, no, I know, but it's, it's, it is like a nice thing. So that's, those are my comments. Those are my thoughts, anyway, cool. right now. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Mickey? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, should I start off being harsh or nice? Whatever. Harsh. 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 The harsh. Okay. I have to say, and you feel free to beat me up on this, but um, it seems that we are all a part of the problem by being um, willing to follow trends <laughs> at times. And one of the biggest, most horrifying trends we have followed is the Apple machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are all reticent to look at it as we're mm -hmm. running along with our apples. Yeah. And I'm mystified as to why someone who is talking about freedom is using apples. Mm -hmm. And do, uh, mm -hmm. is it because we basically don't know what they are? They are not a company, they are a lifestyle that they have sold to people where people actually say, I'm an apple person. <laughs> you know, and and uh, it 
it's really frightening to me, like the, uh, you know, the future, whatever, 1984, which is long gone. <laughs> <laughs> the hammer. <laughs> you know, and it's like a kind of a duality that I, I'm beyond myself with understanding. So I kind of have to skip across a broad space to talk to people about mm -hmm. privacy, but then I realize they're on the other side of the apple, you know, and it's like, oh, geez. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess for people to engage in an open a atmosphere of talking and creating, I believe that now we're at the point where most people feel afraid to do that because people like you have been branded. Branded. Remember that show? No, mm -hmm. you guys are all too young. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a, we're in a bunch of races here. People want to have the most beautiful stuff that's functioning. People want to be comfortable. People want to look professional. They want to do what they do with ease. You can't do that when you're inventing something, when you're creating the future. You're in there with a freaking machete going mm -hmm. like this all day. You're not having time to go, look at the wonderful plan lands and plants around us. You've got to get a tool and get down that river and get the thing built by five. You know, well, oh, I'll take the convenient tool, the Apple or the, you know, Microsoft. I don't just brand Apple. I, you know, like the, the standard operating system sellers that are locking us into these systems that have underlying pinions and gears that tie us to the Facebook thing. You know, it's like, it's all <coughs> so attractive, but we have to realize we've got to get uncomfortable. We have to get really uncomfortable to the point of, think of it as everything you're doing, you're testing the food before your baby gets it. Isn't it? So um, I think we all really need to step back and, and think about what we're teaching people around us when we're using incongruent tools to do something heroic. Um, it's you know kind of like waving a feather at the, at the dust storm and going, I'll clear this thing so you can <laughs> see through to the other side. But we've really got to dig at our foundations. Dig, get yeah. <laughs> You do that all the time. <laughs> one, of our, one of our biggest stories ever, yes. we caught IBM using facial recognition software on every single person who went to Boston, the first Boston calling company. Mm -hmm. I think all our laptops are compromised. There you go. There you go, and it's a constant um, digging through them and getting to know technologists that can free you of these things. And, and being able to form these questions is the part where we feel dumb. And that's, that's as far as I've gotten with researching why people are doing these things that are incongruent. You don't want to appear stupid, and you don't, you've got to get that thing done. You can't be uncomfortable doing it. Your assignment's due by five. How do I new, use this new system? Um, so I think it's really, great what's happening here. This meeting is really important. I think it's super important we form smaller groups to teach each other, to educate each other on how to be better protected and how to help other people be better protected because it's not just one dunk and rinse. Dunk. <laughs> it's like you have to constantly be vigilant as to what, what are people using? Why are they using it? Is there someone in our group who knows about it, can investigate it? No? Oh, well, let's tap into another group. It's a constant learning experience. So um, when things like Mastodon and New Social come along, or the other way around, <coughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's really a wonderful thing. But how the hell do you get anyone to know about it? Mm -hmm. Like, who, who, what, so, how come on Facebook? Yeah. You know, and it hasn't got the pizzazz and fanfare of like a Mac. When, you know, like, um, and it lets me do everything easily. It does things for me. Isn't that great? No, <laughs> everything does something for you. Stop! <laughs> Think about how is it doing that? And now we have the luxury of knowing some technologists, like Chris, other people in the room that we could ask, how is it doing that? You know, it's like, oh, it's getting your router number and doing, oh, really? What does that mean? Learning. We've all become kind of blocked from learning also. We think we know everything, or not everything, but we think, you know, I am the maven of this information, you know, and I could learn a little more, yeah, but, um, We've all got to let down our, our um, big, like the, you know, I've learned this and I'm teaching you. It's more of like, um, can, I, can you tell me anything about this? I know some about it, but you've got to get the, the give and flow. Right? So I think getting into things like promoting Mastodon, promoting new social, promoting these channels where we can have our own groups 
is of major importance. And um, I'm on the leadership committee of May 1st. Has anyone heard of May 1st? GNU, what is it? May GNU. GNU? Yes, yes. yes. What's GNU. GNU to IO. So yes, GNU came out with just an incredible library of tools a long, long time ago, and has since been buried in, <laughs> in yeah. gl glittering objects and shiny things, um, surpassing it. So they have no media marketing arm or of anything. That's mm -hmm. why people don't know about it. And it's very difficult to use now, so yeah, compared to Mastodon. We'll talk about that more yes. later, though. Yeah. Yes, yes. But it's our duty to get in there and make it easy if we feel it's good. Yeah, sure. That's, of course. We need to rush in and say, that's not good. I can't use that. And, and it's the duty of the news industry to publicize this stuff so that people know about it, right? And that's yes. tough yes. when you start to get yes. the upper reaches of the news ecology and they're so closely interlinked to sometimes part of the same multinationals as the digital media companies and, you know, yes. the telecoms and the cable companies. It's, you know, they get massive advertising contracts that basically are like, we'll give you this money, but shut up. Yes. About these alternatives, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, yeah. it's hard. So May 1st is working largely on that platform of getting people to um, talk about what they need and what they want. Um, we're doing things called a convergence, where anyone can create one in there. This is kind of a convergence, <laughs> but we just didn't post it on the site. <laughs> May 1st.org. Um, May 1st.org. And it's the word first. And it's the largest left <coughs> left leaning web hosting membership driven uh, community um, around. And we host sites like Amnesty International, uh, Black Lives Matter, sites that people are always trying to take down and offline. And we're very effective at keeping them online. And you've had strong hassles from the national security state in the we past, yes? get hassled relentlessly yeah. but we deal with it and it's dealable and we're getting bigger and better more people we're based in new york and in mexico mm -hmm. and um, we're having our membership meeting in october in mexico where we <coughs> deal with the issues they're having there which are we seem to be dealing with the same issues but it's like whack-a-mole you know it's like oh it's not a problem there now we fix it oh it's over there now <laughs> so we kind of <laughs> all are able to talk together about this trick's coming down the line. Watch out for that. Um, is but that federal aggravation like above board, or is that all like you suspect? And I mean, how much of it, of it is them uh, uh, serving you subpoenas, and how much of it is them, you know, we suspect that as the government? Um, I would say about 60 40. Gotcha. Um, we do get a lot of subpoenas, and um, we do get a lot of people trying to take down the sites. But um, the, the greatest thing about it is that more people are hearing about May 1st and hearing about what we do. We also create and supply free software tools for people and a kick-ass thing we're coming out with is live streaming. Mm. Um, that would have been really good. <laughs> today, I was like, I realized that looking around there's no floss solution that I could do you yes. know, today at least. I would have had to pull, pull one of you all in and wasn't going to happen. We're no, just waiting for you to boot up Facebook Live for this. Yeah, yeah that <laughs> I, I couldn't do that. And no. I couldn't do Twitter because I didn't want to like, I didn't want our 41,200 followers who like include a lot of corporate types to necessarily watch this real easily. So right. that's, that's but no, with May 1st, I've never streamed on YouTube or anything, but I assume there's a process. You have to, learn, <coughs> you have to do stuff to get there. You do. You I mean, it, I'm using, um, I am using some flaw software, uh, open broadcaster software, uh, you know, to stage this broadcast uh, live, live stream. Uh, and then I'm feeding it, you know, to YouTube live as I could have fed it to any, you know, any platform, of course, right? Yes. It's just that it's, you know, the, the closer you start getting the hardware stuff, the harder the floss movement, you know, has a pro you know, like problem dealing with it. Like, yes. there have been, you know, free Libra, the floss stands for free Libra and open source software. And the wing of that movement, as I'm sure you know, the techies here all know, has tried to do hardware stuff, you know, and has tried to do Still trying. Um, stuff that involves a lot of hardware, like live streaming, where you need a lot of servers and a lot of stuff going on, you know. And with you know, like there was supposed to be a you know a floss phone that didn't really happen. There, there's been attempts at floss laptops and stuff. Yes. They've happened, but then gone away because they're hard to maintain. And, you know, it's all in the it's, works. It's hard, right? Still, so, it's, you know, still. it's a challenge, constant challenge. If May 1st can do live streaming, though, it's yes. going to be used by a lot of folks. It's an amazing service, yeah. and all you have to do is log in with your name and password. Then you see the little screen come up, fix your hair, 
Hit the broadcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you give people the URL. And um, this is all we supply this for $25 a year membership fee. Wow. So I would love it if everyone here could at least sign up for a May1st.org membership and uh, look at the free tools that, that are just <coughs> waiting there for you. And uh, I'm very excited about this organization. We've, we have done come a long way, and we're just about to like surface for people to really know about what we're doing. Cool. Can I just ask Greg, what, what was everybody's uh, live stream city during Occupy? Really, you know, live stream really blew up. What were what were you using? What what was Tim? We were all with? using uh, <laughs> like whatever. Uh, right? Yeah, whatever was available. There were like 50 startups <laughs> trying to do it. Now, most people ended up on Livestream.com, just right. using their stuff, and they had the little boxes and everything. I mean, I will say that you know uh, May 1st and all of them actually hosted most of the tools that we used for Occupy. Okay. Uh, so the websites, the discussion forums, the groups, everything, we did all that on May 1st. Thank you. Yeah? Um, I guess uh, Matt would go next? Yeah, I can go next, I guess, yeah, cool. And Greg again. <laughs> uh, I wanted to do a quick show of hands. Um, put your hand up if you have a personal domain name. I'm, I'm waving my hand. Domain name <laughs> <is> <laughs> yes. For those of you who don't have a personal domain name, uh, that I think is the, the absolute first step you should do. Like, mm -hmm. yep. buy one, it's like $9. Yeah. Unless you want something fancy and exotic. But like a .com or a .org, it's like $9. Get one. Get one, because that will be the first essential tool moving forward with any of this stuff, I think, is identity, right? So can, sorry, can I just interrupt one second? Yeah. I've, this is something I've been thinking, trying to do a couple of times. I have a notorious, very common name, Dan McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> and for a decade, I've gotten emails for Dan McCarthy's all over the world. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got the first Daniel.McCarthy Gmail account when I had a friend working at Google. And wow. Or <laughs> so, and for a decade, I've been res replying to them, drunk or whatever, <laughs> like catalog of these folks. But here's the thing. I've, a couple of times I've tried dot org dot all these different ones. There's a million Dan McCarthy's and everybody has a personalized name. Every permutation of it, I've seen it's either found or been bought up. So is there a way to do that if I have something very common? I only because I'll forget to ask you later. So uh, yeah, you could buy something silly like Dan dot pizza. Yeah. yeah. But Doesn't if I wanted a real name. Per, like if I like I, I guess. No, just by personal just, he means just that you own it, not that oh, it has yeah, 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 like not your name. It. it can be whatever you want it to be. Just oh. like. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, say that as being a foundation. The I thought, oh, 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 I, I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. at the actual getting the name itself. Okay. okay. Yeah, just exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of Martin McCarthy. Your name. Uh, yeah. MCC. And there's a lot of top level domains now that didn't exist a few years yeah, ago. Like I got true. Jason Premis dot like work. There's like a size of famous right. as my name, like a surgeon. Mm -hmm. like dot pizza, as he said. And you can show my domain name. I got, I wanted to get the really short domain. I got mat.tl, which. I so think it's somewhere horrible and like <laughs> not a good regime uh -oh. to be buying domain names from, but eh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Saudi Arabia. <laughs> right. Um, so is that not include like things that are hosted by like WordPress or WordPress or something? Because that's where I, I have mean, my idea. I mean, if you have your own like your own domain name, regardless of where, it, where it's hosted, I think right now, I think yeah. the important thing is to just have a name that's you. Yeah. That like, if I go to that site, it's you, regardless yeah, of like okay. whatever it's about, you know, yeah. where it's hosted. I just can't design. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you've seen this. I mean, look. Uh, uh, it works great on a mobile phone. Um, the second thing is to think about having uh, an email address at your domain name. And again, yes. you could forward that email <coughs> to your Gmail account, right? I'm not suggesting you self host your own email server. No. I don't do that, <laughs> right? I do, but. But you can with mail on a box, it's dead simple to do. Yeah. You can. People might not get your mail. Life is too short. I uh, yeah. <laughs> good with it, but. Right, right. I mean, the, pro the, pro the problem with hosting your own email is the moment Gmail doesn't like you, you're fucked. Because the moment yes. you can't email 90% of the world, it doesn't matter, right? So. The one point of failure. That's right. what they're hurting us into. So they have one button to shut you off. Right, but then you can pay return back $15,000 and they'll whitelist you at all those. And yes. you can't get blacklisted. There you go. Right. I did not know. $15,000. Return back $15,000 a year. For what? Uh, you get whitelisted at everyone, Comcast, Gmail, Microsoft, all of them, uh, and they just uh, tell you when you've done something bad, but don't ever block you in any way. Do the company get money from them? Return pack. I know, but who is that? Oh, it's this company. They have API access into <laughs> all of them. They actually run software on Gmail Return servers, back? on Microsoft pass, servers. Pass. Yeah, all of them. Uh, so they get live reports of all of your IP addresses and what they're doing on email so they can uh, make sure you're good. 
Uh, so 15,000 a year and your own personal email server will never get blocked. Right to the inbox, right at the top. Oh, no problem, 15,000. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? We, we've all got that, right? I'll, I'll get, I'll get right. two accounts at that price, yeah. you know. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Those, I think those are the two kind of key, like, first steps for anyone in this room is to have your own domain name, have your own email address at your own domain name, forward it wherever you need to forward it right now. Um, then start thinking about uh, this notion of, like, posting stuff on your own site and then having that your own site push that out to other places. So if you, you know, I don't think everyone has the convenience of being able to just completely get rid of Facebook because you would miss out on like pictures of babies, <laughs> weddings, <laughs> birthdays, and that's about it. But maybe you miss <laughs> out on those things, right? But like, um, but you could post stuff from your own site to Facebook, to Twitter, to Good News Social, to Mastodon. You can use all these services and kind of see which one works out in the long run mm -hmm. but just kind of post it on your own site mm -hmm. i think that's the key really is to like um can you bring up well.com chris w-e-l-l -L? yeah so this is the thing uh oh, w-e-l yeah, yeah, yeah sorry um the well is a weird thing mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's all fancy it's it's now now, but it's i still use the well I've been, I've been paying 15 dollars a month for this Forever. for 27 years God. i never did wow. it it's where all my friends yeah are. Um, it's an offshoot of the Whole Earth Catalog. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, it's actually, WELL stands mm -hmm. for Whole Earth Electronic Link. Yep. It's oh, old yeah. as hell, and it's been around forever. Yeah. Uh, but they have this thing of, like, you own your own words. Like, whatever you put in, you can take away. Now, it's a community of talking about Grateful Dead and, and whatever else, but, like, there's a bunch more other stuff on there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and as internet grandpa, we can talk about, B, you know, I can talk about, you know, BBS, you know, the bulletin board services that right. people used to dial yes. in with landline phones, you know, and modems to, like, sure. yeah. get into these early services. Yeah. What's that? Conference is a group. Yeah, it's like, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a chat, but they have, the conferences, they go on for, like, forever. Like, you'll, you'll go on there and you'll find, I mean, for example, yeah. one, last year, there was a Twin Peaks discussion from the 90s. It just picked up again. <laughs> <laughs> and people were, people were responding literally with like, like you know, no, I don't, I'm not going to spoil Twin Peaks for you, but like, yeah. oh, that's who killed Laura Palmer. You know, like, <laughs> quoting someone died, from 17 cool. years before. That's wow. And people talking about like where to buy laser discs. It's, <laughs> this is an ongoing discussion forever. It's worth joining, Chris. Does anybody here use Quora? Yes. Yeah. yeah. My father's on Cora about 25 hours a day. He like gets a, they say he's like in the book every year and stuff like that. He travels to people's weddings, and uh, it's mind boggling. It's it's like its own. I just can't even see it. But you'll stumble upon a Cora question every now and then. It's yeah, it's kind of very intelligent. A lot of intelligent people. A lot of professors and stuff like this. And you pose a question and it's answered. But it's yeah. it's its own little walled garden. My <coughs> father has no idea what happens on Twitter. Right. Nice. Yeah. I think I think really that. Those are the, those like just the first step, I think, <coughs> to just kind of get into this mindset of like owning what you do, and then also explicitly like licensing and when you publish things, like stamp your name on it, but also stamp on it like the conditions which you think it should be shared under. So I worked for Creative Commons for a number of years, mm -hmm. and Creative Commons kind of invented this like sharing method, like the kind of free software model but for culture, right? So three simple questions, uh, you know, do you want this thing to be remixed? You almost certainly want to say yes to that one. Uh, Non-commercial or commercial use, honestly, it's kind of hard to define commercial use, so I would allow that too. But the key, I think, the, the nice one is the share alike one. So that's the one where if someone uses your thing and their thing, they are also kind of bound to like realize it's their thing in that same condition. So you can kind of create this culture of sharing that way too. And I guess also attribution. Attribution is key. Yeah, I mean that's the you gotta put someone's you gotta give credit for yeah. credit is due. Yeah. Um, is that John Carroll local? I actually don't know. Um, you can look up his. Oh yeah, I can look up his wallet account for you. Um, and I think, yeah, there's, I guess one more thing to think about, I guess, is um, is just we don't have to necessarily um, do what these big sites tell us to do. And my GNU stuff, when we did GNU FM, <coughs> which is a kind of free software clone of Last FM, um, we began federating with them through our own service, but we just didn't ask permission. They were in kind of a weird state. CBS just bought them and then everyone kind of hated them. Um, <laughs> when CBS Music 
you know, big like a big music label owns your listening data. That's kind of terrifying to people, and so we got a lot of people jump ship. We've about four million users right now, which is what, what's, wow. what's it? What's it's a uh, GNU FM. Uh, it's on the like GNU.io again. Mm-hmm. It's uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the top there, GNU FM. So GNU FM is just like a. Uh, right. It's basically, it's last FM, but it's free software. And so there's a site linked in that first paragraph, Libre FM, which is my ser- essentially the server that I run. And uh, we have a quarter million people using this site. And, and when we had that initial like bunch of people come to us, I actually intentionally didn't build, there is no communication <coughs> on this. There's like barely any kind of social interaction because I didn't want to be the host of a quarter million people's <laughs> social interactions because you know, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. seems like a messy thing to I mean, getting <coughs> Getting away from a silo to a slightly smaller, slightly uglier, slightly worse maintained silo doesn't seem like a, a great deal for anyone either. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we, we have this full, uh, you can use our server. If you have any thing that can talk to Last.fm, you can use, sign up for an account with us, point your computer at our server rather than their server. And we have some, some nice ways of doing that and some other ways of doing <coughs> that too if it doesn't quite work. But you can federate back to Last.fm. So you can still get all the benefit of Last.fm, but you can own your own data. And you can install this software on your own server too. It's really easy. It takes five minutes to install. You need a five dollar a month hosting account. I'll do it for you. Uh, you can host your own listening data, keep it yourself, and then also get the advantage of using the things that Last.fm gives you. But at the same time, you get to own stuff. And we also have a ton of music on here you can listen to, and everything is freely licensed for remix, commercial remix, uh, reuse, everything. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Yeah, so yeah, domain names. Go to Gandhi.net is a good site to buy domain names from. They, uh, they're they based in France. They will give you who is. Pro- pro- uh, I respect Gandhi more. No H. No H. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Correct. But yeah, these guys, are, they're based in France. They are the good price. I mean, their slogan is no bullshit, <laughs> right? Uh, is, they, uh, they are the they kind take of part like, in all of the act- activism too. Yeah, they. Uh, it's not kind of widely known, but basically, all the people like EFF, Creative Commons, FSF, Gnu, all those people, they get their domain names from Gandhi because Gandhi basically takes a little bit of money from everyone else buying domain names, puts puts into a giant pile, and it's like gives gives domain names for the right things. So, um, yeah, and they're they're fantastic. And you get everything, when you buy a domain name, they give you everything, they give you hosting, email, all that kind of stuff for free with your domain name, or you can post it, point it wherever else else you want to do it. If you don't have a domain name and you have a laptop, like, (laughs) you can do that right now, and I will be asking at the end again, make sure you have all domain names. Um, Anything to say on uh, pulling down the corporate media bigs, corporate social media bigs? I think, I think, I do think the first step is to get that, get that your own site and start posting out. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it because that way then you can have the trickle effect of like, you can post things to Facebook but have everything linked back to you. Mm-hmm. And if you can start to bring that discussion back to your own site, that's where, that's that's the first step in killing in killing, like killing off Facebook is get, you know, sure, have people like it on Facebook if they want to, but bring that discussion back to your own site. Yes. And then for bringing it from Facebook, from Twitter, from <laughs> Mastodon or GNU Social or whatever, from the, from the, from the paper itself. Give everything a unique URL. <coughs> Give every column in the paper a, a short link that's a, on a dig owned domain name, mm-hmm. and have people come there and, and discuss and share and like. And, you know, I think that's the first step because you can start to bring your audience with you, and you can certainly bring the active people with you. And once once they're coming to your site, also on your site, make sure you have a newsletter. Sign up. Mm-hmm. It's easy, yeah. and don't use Mailchimp. No, we use uh, constant <laughs> contact as it happens. Right. Yeah, so for dig. Constant yeah. contact local. Yeah, they're all with them, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, we fought the weed war with them. Oh. And all the cannabis newsletters across <coughs> the country are on them now. That's great. So that's a war we don't want. Even if we move everything else somewhere else, we're going to keep the weed on constant. I mean, Melchip's fine, but it just wants to hit 5,000 subscribers, then they start gouging you for money. Yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> then it's hard to get away from them because all your stuff is in there. And it's right. <laughs> yeah. Work. Uh, I, have, I actually have a question about that. So, you know, um, I, I guess the answer is not going to be a always the easiest, right? <laughs> what we want to hear. We don't want the easiest. I mean, I, I the, 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 the apps are horrible for, a, a, obviously, a lot yeah. of stuff. You know, MailChimp's mm-hmm. app is even inadequate, so it's hard to imagine, you know, but, but this is the things we'll have to deal with, right? 
Yes. No app. Oh my god. Go oh, endless. <laughs> I won't be able to look every five seconds He's at how many people open my emails. <laughs> well, you can use the city CRM. You can use and give you some of that stuff. Yes. Yeah, maybe and that's open source too. City yeah. CRM. Yeah, we're going to be building new city. sites for C I V I. Yeah. C I V I CRM, folks. Yeah. We're going to be building new sites as it happens for Dig Boston and, and for Binge. Although we you know we're not just doing this event for us; we're doing it for yeah. all the other you know news news outlets that want to work with us and stuff too. Of course. Yeah, I know. That, I know that locally, I think the Rainbow Green Party is starting to use CBCRM as well. Hmm. Yeah, I've used it before. I mean, like you know, um, Pirates already used. Yeah, Free Software Foundation uses it. Creative Commons uses it. I mean, like EFF uses it. Uh, so it's. I think you've got an ad there, Chris. That's not them. Yeah, yeah. not them. Mm. Now you fell for the ads again. Go down. <laughs> One word, Chris. Go to, go to your brain. Right. 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 You know, you can get this thing, you can set up yourself, and it's you can you can start doing, getting getting people's names, getting people's numbers. It can hook into things like texting people automatically for you. You know, you can run a newsletter out of this, and again, yes. like mm -hmm. you can run fundraising out of it. Yeah, yeah, the CRM All donation management. Is a cool oh, wow. resource. Yeah. yeah, I'm diving into it right now. If anyone wants to tag me and get on board and like maybe meet once a week or virtually once a week, there's also a meeting at the it. SSF once a month about CBC around. Yes. That no one goes to right now. <laughs> if you all went to we it, then it would be good, right? You know. FSF is free software free foundation, pizza, folks. You know, so. We yeah. have a lot of this stuff here in Boston, which makes it easier for us. But for the rest, for rest of you out there, you're going to have to Is there anything um, like uh, Thunderclap-ish built into this at all? No. No, there's never might couldn't be. There might be a plugin or something like that, right? Like yeah. A lot of these systems end up having that developer ecosystem built around them. So yes. if you want to do something like Thunderclap, Bring might it be able up. to send out yeah. an email blast to everyone. It's my dream. I've got a hundred freelancers that are willing to let me blast them. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm really sorry to do this. I really want to hear what Greg says. Um, I need to maybe beg for a little bit of redirection here. I feel like this, I don't, I don't think we have a lot of time, and I feel like the conversation is getting very diffuse. And there are a lot of journalists out there who are trying to connect with readers and not use Facebook. And if we can be laser focused on that, that would be fantastic. I really do want to come out of this with some sense of where to go. And I gotta say, this idea of don't do the easy thing is not gonna work for me. True. I have a day job and I try to do all my media <laughs> with all my other time. Mm -hmm. And That's I problem. need things to be easy. And you're not gonna get readers and we're not gonna get journalists to sign up if it's not easy. So all the technologists here have to know that some of the stuff you're talking about, I need a lexicon. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't know how it connects with what I need to do. Correct. So all this conversation is fantastic, but I just need to know going in. Yeah. Can Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. That's everyone well, say that when they need it because it'll come up a lot. Mm -hmm. That's important to know. One of the most frustrating things for me as a journalist over the past decade or so has been this concept that journalists also have to be programmers. <laughs> no bigger aggravation for me than the concept. Like, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to be a journalist. Let's so I do want those tools. Uh, sorry, if I could speak to that just a little bit. Okay. Uh, for a while I was working at the Globe, and I've had an occasion to interact with a number of journalists at this point. Um, I'm someone who got into technology as a blogger originally, didn't know how to code at all, started learning very small bits and pieces of it, just because I need to have the blog do things. Mm -hmm. And so I don't I don't think of myself first and foremost as a technologist. And when I encounter other people who are at that stage of there's something that I really want to do, and it it seems to me that like everyone else in the world who is succeeding at that thing that they want to do is able to do it because of technology, to hear that person say that uh, they want to do that thing, but they don't want to use technology to do it is very frustrating. I don't think that's what you're saying, but you're saying something that could be very close to it. And so I just want to make sure that there's that distinction between I want to be a journalist, but I don't want to have to be a programmer. 
which is totally fair, versus I want to be a journalist and I don't want to have to learn more about technology, which is a path to not being a successful journalist. I am building tools, but I'm building tools via a developer that I'm paying to develop tools. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you're right to point out there are different skill sets. I, I, I think I think that's really important in the conversation as well. That you know there are people who there there are some people who are, are great technologists and great journalists, but it's not necessarily a skill set that that aligns. And that the conversation I think has to include the a, a recognition of both the skill sets and and not say well. Each, you know, uh, are the technologists necessarily the people who could go out and do what journalists do? Probably not. So let's let's have some space for, for recognizing that people are in different lanes and like let, let's let them merge and, and, yeah. and work together. Um, you know, maybe carpool, um, but but not assume that everybody has to have the same skills. Well, I was going to have Greg address us, who he happens to be both you know <laughs> journalists and programmers. Don't you do it? You know, so we'll <laughs> let him do his thing, and then we'll open it up. Sure. I mean, you know, I agree with you on the laser focus here, but I do want to respond as quick as I can to a couple things here. One, your you know statement about the Macs. <coughs> I use a Mac, and I you know who I am, right? I mean, a hacker, well known for it. Um, if you're using one and you do want to protect as much of your privacy as you can, you should be running Little Snitch and Micro Snitch. Yeah. Little Snitch <laughs> blocks or allows you to at least see every single outgoing connection that your computer attempts to make to the internet. Load up Photoshop after loading Little <coughs> Snitch and you will see it contact Google 51 times on load and like 50 other trackers too. And you can block <laughs> them all because it doesn't need to do that. Um, micro snitch pops up and warns you every time any application starts using your mic or your camera. Um, and so I would run both of those. They're cheap. They're like 30, 40 bucks or something. Yeah. And, uh, and they sell them together. They're from the same company. Uh, so to address that, I would at least be doing that on a Mac. Um, to uh, your point about everyone owning a domain and all that fun stuff, you know, it kind of ties into the bigger thing that I wanted to bring up is also ties into you guys not paying uh, the hundred dollars a week anymore. The reason so many people are paying that money is because that's where the traffic comes from. And if you want to fund your journalism, you need the page views, which is why we see the sensationalism in journalism, because I'm going to get paid if my article drives in 10,000 views, and I'm not if it doesn't. And I might not even get asked to write another article if it doesn't. So you get all the traffic from these platforms. Um, so if you are building your own system, the thing that you need to learn about is capturing those users. On first visit, you need to get their email addresses, you need to get signups, you need to get them commenting on your platforms, you need to have systems that reach out to them. I mean, all the apps work and drive traffic because they do push notifications, because they do their own emails on every action. You know, if you, you might remember, Facebook doesn't do it as much anymore, but literally every time someone liked something in that first year, it would tell you in an email that you got a like, you know, and that drove the interactions. And unless your personal websites are doing that type of stuff, no one's coming back to them. Um, and it's kind of because of our addiction to our phones, you know, the, the interactions on there are what's driving that traffic. And I yep. think for the big corporate media, especially the Facebooks, the Twitters, you know, that's why everyone's using it. It's just the traffic. I'm not getting my mom to use tools like this, but she has a Facebook account. Uh, she can barely use it, but she has one. Um, I, I just, I know I'm never getting her any farther than Facebook. So how do we get the thing that as journalists we need, the viewers to actually read our material without using the platforms where all the users are? That's that's the big question I have. I don't, I don't have an answer for it. I I just want that question answered. I got a one. Well, as Matt said, funnel them from Facebook to your site. The only thing you should be posting on Facebook is a link to your site. Mm -hmm. you, you can post like a, you, know, you can post yeah. like a, a genuine Facebook post, but it's in a way where it's designed to come back to you. Yes. Yeah, of course. And uh, as you guys saw, you know, when, when he was showing my stuff, I have GregHouch.com for the podcast. But we have on there, you know, there's mailing list signups. On the other websites I run, there's mailing list signups. There's as few pop-ups as I can possibly put on things, um, I try to do, but asking people, look, if you want to pay attention to me, I'm not going to be on all the social media. Maybe you can come and uh, you know check me out on all the other things. And uh, there's push notification systems that are really cheap that tie into uh, WordPress that you can use. Um, I just, you know, I think the, the big thing you need to learn to do if you are going to be running your own sites and posting out instead of you know just posting your stuff on the social media platforms like Matt was saying, is you need to capture those users or there's no point to even posting it on social media if you posted it on your own site because you need them to keep coming back and slowly weaning them off of finding you on social media. Let me just say that one of the 
I just jump in for a second. One of the things that um, is most frustrating to us with Facebook, I mean, as a news organization, is the fact that their their algorithm started cratering news sites about a year and a half ago, whatever. I mean, literally, we used to get, before paying any five, ten, whatever bucks we pay on certain articles, which is all we can afford as a smaller, you know, organization, bigger ones will pay, you know, tens of thousands, you know, daily, whatever. Um, we would get, like on, on one of my columns, let's say I'd get 250 likes, 500 likes, pretty easily, right? Then I'd pay and get a thousand, you no know, more, right? Our, our native audience is about um, uh, 11,000 people on our main Facebook page and 13,000 in the subsidiary page. They wouldn't let us merge. And we run this. Which is one of the... Um, I'm behind the guy. We run, we'll tell the audience what it is because we're not... Doing Sorry. It. Yeah, we, we run... Well, this is a good example of... Which is what... Which is still natural. We run Dirty Old Boston. Yeah. Which is... It gets it never boosted a pay, never once boosted a single thing, mm. uh, never paid once, and uh, you know two hundred twenty seven shares is not even a lot. Um, yeah, I mean they, for us, the ones that just get, you know, they go well over a thousand sometimes. It's mind boggling. What, but what's up with that? It's just plus. it's like cats and dogs. Unless and other you stuff have it, unless you, you have one hundred fifty thousand followers, it's not going to work. Oh, well, so because it got up to that number, it's just natural. Right, you, you, a lot of people with these numbers got there before a lot of these changes that's that right. made it hard. That's so right. huh. it'd be, I think, you know, one of the Twitter accounts that I had access to is at 1.8 million followers. When yeah. I was using it for years, it was in the 1.2 to 1.4 range. And <laughs> we would put out a tweet with a link, and we could, on average, drive 350,000 views just by setting up that link. Yeah. And this was uh, the Your Non News Twitter account. Um, and today, when they link out, and now they even have 400,000 more people, they are lucky to get 50,000 views out of it. The Facebook page that is now mostly uh, tied to that has over 12 million people, not 150,000. Is it? Uh, it's just uh, anonymous official, and that's a horrible word, and it shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, but uh, I believe that's what they call themselves now. They renamed, yeah, they renamed it a, a month ago or so. But they have 12 million on theirs, and I was talking to one of their admins, and oh yeah, no, they're down to 9.8 now. Their numbers have been falling really fast as uh, all the Russians seem to be going <laughs> away. Um, but even with that, you'll see uh, their numbers on stuff there where they got like 40K right there. There's no boosting, but with that, when that post went up was months ago, they were getting three to four hundred thousand two years ago off of those numbers. Now it's down to that, yeah, and you, like, the wow, cratering is just why? Like, oh, what is cratering? Sorry. it's it's oh. you know it's their algorithm on Facebook shows it decides what it's going to show you when you're looking at Facebook, right. and Facebook has slowly changed their algorithm to show less and less of the people that don't pay. The more you pay into their system, the more happy their algorithm seems to be with your page and your group, and the more people it's going to show it to. Even if you're not boosting that post, it seems, and there, there's some really good reports out there that show this, that this this would be at double those numbers if they were boosting other posts, mm -hmm. just because you seem to get some kind of credit on your account for doing that. Mm -hmm. you know, um, one thing that, and I just wanted to, as far as like kind of getting those audiences off, and Mark, one thing we're doing is with our newsletter, since we stopped being as you know, active on Facebook and boosting like that, you know, one thing that was great about Facebook is that um, you know, we, you know, or you could be be anywhere, but you're making groups, really finding out. We did a big bike series last year. People who were there. So one thing we're doing is through our emails, we're doing a lot of click, click segmentation. Um, so every email that goes out, every link, we, you know, it, every link that everybody clicks on, it, it sets a list. So if they click on an article about sports, they're on my sports list. They click on an article. So for you, you know, break it up. Whatever, everything came. It could be different. You know, the coast or this or that. City Hall stuff. Some people, I mean, I can't, you know, we have people who just don't want to read a goddamn thing about politics. And ASAP, I'm going to stop sending them emails about politics. Oh. Just get the A&E stuff. <laughs> well, we'll see. I mean, I'm not just trying to get people what they want. We'll, but, you know, uh, you know, frankly, we, um, you know, the people don't want to hear about weed at all. That's why we broke it yeah, up we into did a separate some newsletter altogether. <laughs> so, you know, those, that's one thing that, you know, especially just listening to this room. This is something we've been kind of doing. Now I kind of really understand why we're doing it and how we can really start to redirect like that. I mean, it's the old, the oldest form of communication, email. One more element I need to throw out there as we head deeper into the discussion is uh, what we take from Facebook, not what we give mm. Facebook. Yeah, I like that. So, um, you know, there's no real PR apparatus anymore, and people in the community have never used it anyway. What they are doing is they're posting to Facebook, 
when I put together uh, a list of what to do in Cambridge in summer versus <coughs> week, it is almost all from Facebook. Not because that's where it is, but just because I know where to look and right. where I know where stuff is. Mm -hmm. I steal Boston. photos from Facebook okay. and events. And like you guys, when you guys are having uh, a marathon at uh, Somerville Media Center, that's where I find it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I know to tell people, hey, you should tune in. So it's not just sending stuff out there. Does anyone here use the Boston Calendar, that site? Yeah, yeah, they, they do a big list every year. Every yeah. year, right? Okay. I mean, so that's a good example of one that's on its own, right? Well, yeah. they, they put it on Facebook too, right? I don't know. Well, they started in top of Reddit through Reddit's Boston Social Club community. Right. Ah, okay. One problem with these, you know, confabs is, is that inevitably people start throwing out by a Mark. bunch of different sites and services, which I think is part of what you know Mark over here was reacting to, like it. It, which we need to do, but it is tough, you know, because we're also trying to sort of. Um, start, you know, a larger, longer term conversation about, you know, what we might do about the problems that we're facing from the, the social media giants. And, you know, maybe the answer is that there is no solution, but I mean, we, have, we at least need to ask the questions. On, on, along the road, though, inevitably, people are doing all kinds of projects. Because when you're talking about something like Facebook, it's an entity that has 2 billion users, half of whom might even be real people. You know, so like, um, um, you know, so that that's the scale we're talking about. And then the projects people start might have, yeah, if they're if they're doing well, they might have a quarter million or whatever. But you know, or in the case of anonymous, you know, even more than that. But but largely, um, uh, they're smaller, so we don't hear about them. So we come to these events and we want to tell each other all these things, and then just we get this mountain of things, and that's part of the problem. Like, how much attention does someone have during the day, right? You know, to like do anything, look at news. Look at cats, you know, whatever. Talk to their friends. It's limited, so it's you know any solution we come up with has to sort of again, apropos of what Mark said, you know, have to be easy in the sense of you know it's 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 ubiquitous, it's present in a lot of places, it's easy to get to from different devices, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Greg, I'm sorry, if you have more stuff to say, you know, please no, do. No, I mean, that's just my big, my big issue is, you know, mm -hmm. when I want traffic to a thing, I have to go to the corporate social media right now. Yeah. There, there's no other place to get it, because like you said, that's where the two billion users are. Yep. And like I said, that's where my mom is, and I Mine can't, too. I can't <laughs> convince her. I, I got her on a cell phone <laughs> four years ago. <laughs> like, literally, it took that long for it to even adopt that, so... You're not getting the general public on these platforms is, is my big issue. Well, a lot of the news work I've done in just going on television and talking about things or the TV work like with House of Cards or any of the other shows that I, I've, I've helped on is to try and get a lot of the tech into a way where the general public can digest it. And I tell you, that's the hardest thing I've ever had to do is trying to get my mom to understand something tech while I'm sitting on CNN. Like, you know, it's... it's yeah. We're not getting them onto these platforms. I will never get my mother to understand what Mastodon is, even though I can show it to her side by side with the other platforms. Right. right. So how do we get traffic without using these systems? So, so what you know, one of the things I think about though is sort of like I like to think of places like uh, like these platforms as like your your local bar or whatever, right? And so sort of like. Well, here's the bar that the 20-somethings go to, and here's the pub that the 50-somethings go to. And, you know, and so, so in some ways you're trying to say, like, hey, 20-year-olds, don't you want to go hang out with the 50-year-olds? <laughs> right? so, sort of like, so I, I think it's, but, but what you really need is you need someone from that, the 20-year-old club and the 50-year-old pub to be talking to each other so they know what's mm -hmm. happening, right? So I, that's why I feel like some of this is about the social relations between folks. So like, okay, I know X, Y, and Z are doing this. And I'm going to promote what they're doing because I think they're doing good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure the people I'm con connected to know about the, the article they put on this site or the podcast that happened over here. And I'm going to share in my networks. And then if you're part of diverse enough networks of people, you start to really start spreading out your reach. And so I think it's about finding influencers in communities folks who are no, who maybe they are connected to the right people. And so I, I think that that's why I feel like some of this is not about like the platform or the technology. It's really about the social structure and about you know who's forming alliances with who and who's talking to whom and who's sharing across networks. And do you have broad enough networks that you actually expand your reach? If I'm talking to the same 10 people every day, I'm not gonna get a reach. How do I reach to broader people? By forming relationships with folks that trust me and I trust them. And like that, they're good people. So like, 
Jason tells me, okay, we're doing this. I'm like, okay, I trust that. I'm going to share that with people because that's I trust that. I don't know who that person over there is. Maybe I'll say, share it if it seems reasonable right. to me. So I think there's some of those things about this is good. This this is a gathering too. When you were talking about like pig access stations, like three of them in Massachusetts, right. and none of them talking to each other. <laughs> Partly they all have their local community they're focusing on, and so trying to help them to figure out how do you connect the local to the to the global. How do you come up with ideas that reach across communities and have conversations, but you can still I'm still going to be concerned with Lowell. I'm still going to care about Lowell. And I think the big, yeah. the big problem is is a lack of communication. People yeah. don't trust each other. They're not, and so. Um, you know, that with bins, that's been our big thing. We don't just help as big, we help as many people as yeah. possible. And I just want to show one thing, and this is like this. I don't know how social this is. Just but tell we, us what it is. We have, this is called the bin story map. It's not launched yet. In fact, okay. we have a bunch of stuff, but you know, uh, some, some outlets have story maps. Uh, True Story, it's told me, to me by the person who did the Globe built the story map. Were you there for that by any chance? They put it up on the screen in front of the newsroom. It showed that they don't report on Roxbury, Dorchester, or Mattapan. They took it down and they never looked at it again. And you told me that, didn't you? You can find it online. And, uh, but, but anyway, so this is going to be our story map. And uh, we just had all the stuff redone. But it'll have stories from everyone from, from Cambridge Day to... Uh, um, to Bay State exactly. Banner, to the dig, instead of just like, you know, Austin Monitor has a great one, but it's just the Austin Monitor story. So this is, you know, we're just trying that's, to connect across balance. See, this is why I, I called in my latest editorial for, oh, turn the camera to me, um, for, uh, no, it's not pointing to me. Um, for us to think about, and this, this is not a discussion that I started, but it's been out there, you know, um, that the, you know, have the government step in and create a public utility that replaces Facebook and Twitter and so on. Because just like in the net neutrality movement, we've been calling for big, fat, dumb pipes to carry the data, right? That there's no, re there's no reason why corporations have to be running that architecture. And in many cases, the government started the architecture to begin with, which was definitely the case with the internet. And then it's been, it's been colonized by the private, you know, corporations. Um, similarly, with social media, I don't, you know, people aren't like in love with a particular company when they're, when they're creating these essentially neighborhood spaces online or whatever. They're, they're using it because it's there and it's, as we've said, easy to use. Mm -hmm. So why not have you know a government agency? It can be quasi-independent like the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. It, it can be run by regional boards. It doesn't have to be a big, as I said, national security state panopticon operation, although inevitably they'll come in. What are you gonna do? You know, but like that's why I brought that up. You know? People want to talk. Yeah, I'm gonna shut up now. Yeah, Jason, I have a bunch of thoughts. Uh, whoever. Why not? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, the one thing we're not talking about at all here, and I think we need to, is business models. Um, it's great to you know really kind of think big picture and what these things could be and should be. But let's be honest. You know, if we're going to start something that makes money for journalism, supports journalism, and actually works for people, there has to be a business model that's different than free content and advertising and stealing your data, or, not, or perhaps just harvesting your data to manipulate you to look at what they want you to look at. That's the solution space. Uh, 15 years ago, no one knew what Facebook was, right? Now there's two billion people there. And it's wrong-headed, I think, to assume that something can't change and there can't be something new if while we sit around just throw our hands up and say, well, how can we fight the big guys? Just stop it. You know, Stop worrying about Facebook for a while and start thinking about solution space. And the other thing I'd say that I think is really wrong-headed is to assume all technologists are kind of evil I don't think that's true. <laughs> no. I do think um, that there's plenty of social entrepreneurs out there who are interested in doing good things and who want to work with people who are creating great journalism to support what they're doing or arts or other things. So it's really important as we're com you know, complaining how social media makes us go into our silos that we don't do that ourselves. Part of what we have to do is reach across and talk to people we're not used to working with to come up with new solutions. So if you think about what's the ecosystem we're in for startups right now in this country, it's the obsession with the unicorn, right? The obsession with the billions of dollars that those you know, few people are gonna make. So that's what gets funded, that's the cycle that we're in. Um, but what you're seeing starting now is a little bit more of interest in social entrepreneurship, which is a different kind of capital, right? So not everybody feels like their motivation in life is to be a billionaire. The ones you know, the Zuckerbergs, you know, for sure. But is that all there is to aspire to in this world? No. And so assuming that anyone who's interested in technology is either you know, completely in the dark web hacking away or <laughs> is, you know, Zuckerberg is bull. There are a whole lot of people in between and we should stop demonizing each other in that way here because we're doing that. So cut it out. <laughs> you know, we can all come together and work together. And I think that it's really, really important 
that we look at solution space and not just sort of bitching about, you know, the way the world is. Because, yeah, it sucks, but it's our fault. All of us. We're all addicted to our phones. We all built this. You know, for journalism, it was a great way to get stuff out there cheap and free. You know, really drove the content. But what, what were we trading? Now we know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now we know. And so let's build something different. What would it look like? I'd love to ask the journalists in the room, what would it look like? What do you need? What do you need from technologists? Tell us. We're here. We're listening. Well, being that I'm going to be the one helping with uh, the Digs new website, uh, I would love some answers to that too. What do you guys want? <laughs> what do you need? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, 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 we haven't even sat well, down. I, mean, I think my, my vision for the I, I would bet anything, and it's not just because we're doing it mm -hmm. among the first, but I, I truly believe that every news site will have a uh, crowdfunding when you go onto it within within four years from now. I just want to be the first to do it. We um, need we're, re we're really not seeing it enough, and. You know, everything that we've learned, we've, we've used all the, I just wrote an essay for a journalism site about how we use them all. Uh, Spot.us, Contributoria, Beacon Reader. Fail, 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 fourth fail, Kickstarter journalism, total joke. Look at they have projects from last year on there. Um, so, you know, that, I think that's a big thing. And, and I'm, I'm, I, Could you just explain just a little bit what are, these are Kickstarters? Well, basically, yeah, I mean, it, it boggles the mind and this is the group yeah. really have this in. And I hope this that? speaks right. to what you're looking at. Is that it basically like having our uh, uh, everybody's uh, we're always relying on crowdfund on these crowdfunding sites? You know, Indiegogo is not that on the non profit side, we should say on the non profit side, but I think this is the future of the for profit side too. Is, is really you know, it doesn't have to be a tax write off, the crowdfunding story, and it's also that's also everybody's talking about the word engagement, but that's all built in, mm -hmm. you know. So people are you know, uh, now that everybody already has something when you go to the site, it's like hey, give us money the way the Guardian does, I think mm -hmm. this needs to take it to the next step for what. Um, so a lot of the stuff we've learned on the nonprofit side over there. Now that we're looking into this stuff, so far we talked about this yesterday about like the, the pl uh, you know really it's not from what we understand it's not a simple white label kind of uh, you know crowdfunding plugin that uh, that we can really use at this juncture. So something will have to be done. I mean I think. There Actually, I mean, I've already investigated that a lot for almost what yeah. you said, and there are like 10 different systems are that different. are inexpensive and easily modifiable to your needs. That's where, so that's really where it's at. I think that's going to be an important part for anybody, anybody building on a tree. I don't want to keep talking. Those? I know we only have yeah. 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 I know you want to say something for a little Yeah, I, I, oh, I, I put a, a couple little things out there. Um, one is, I, I think, on this, you know, if, if you want people to come to news sites, I, mean, I, I think this is something that has to change in society in general, we have to, if we want something to exist, we have to be willing to pay for it. Yes. Um, yeah. And at, at a certain point, that's that's going to be a, a change that we have to be willing as a society to, to go with. Um, I think uh, just even in um, the last month when we were talking to librarians together and journalists, um, and we came in, I think, with a similar idea of this like, big ideas we were going to fight misinformation and disinformation, you know, fake news. It's a big idea, and people came in with these big ideas about um, local problems, and we walked away with uh, you know, nine suggestions that were all super local, um, you know, situated in the library. And each one you looked at, and went, wow, this is really exciting, but fake news, it's really big, this feels really small. Um, and so I, I think when we go back and forth, we, we have that feeling of, is this up to, you know, is this plan as big as we need it to be for the, the scope of the problem? But we are at a place where it is the local. I mean, we don't necessarily have answers to the big issues without starting at these smaller spaces. Um, and then the last part is, I, I think when we talk about these spaces as being um, you know, grounded in, in physical space, where it's uh, the library or, or small communities. Um, I think about my students who uh, you know, teach college. Um, they aren't actually rooted in space in the same way. Um, they are virtual in a lot of the ways they're interacting, and that's something else we have to think about. For the library, we're going to bring people in. Well, those are the people who are already connected in some way to the library. Um, the people who are hooked into the community that they come, that they're already there and they have those roots. How do we pull in people who don't already have those connections, the people who don't have those 
uh, practices of civic engagement. And I, I think that's worth thinking about as well. So, and then, yes, to one of the um, dimensions we're not really talking about here in that in, with this time frame, I mean, what do we do now? Um, you know, with the sort of marked problem. Um, and then there are, you know, longer term things like, oh yes, get the government, you know, to do social media as a, you know, neutral public utility, you know, that's 10 yeah. years, 20 years, et cetera. Um, and I think it's important to make those distinctions because, you know, when you come in looking for big ideas, but you're also practical people um, and you want to actually get something done, I mean, they tend to be small. Um, and, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm an old guy, so I'm beginning to think about what can actually get accomplished in my lifetime. Yes. Um, and in some ways, you know, there are things, you know, you should be, for, for the long-term stuff, you should be looking at the 20-year-olds and start thinking about slowly shifting their behavior because they're going to, you know, have long lifetimes. Um, and, you know, that, that's the legacy here. Um, you know, it, it doesn't build you a viral audience, but I don't, you know, I don't think that's really accomplishable unless somebody comes up with a brilliant idea um, at a particular time um, and is sort of vaguely dishonest about it, like Facebook. Um, I mean, those days are past, I and mean, we're just not going to be able to, to do those sorts of things, and, that, and that's a good thing because, you know, Facebook, um, I mean, the unicorns are largely built on, um, let's call it regulatory arbitrage, where they forget about, you know, the laws, of the laws and the norms, and just, you know, throw shit out there, and, you know, we all have to live with it. So, I mean, I think, you know, there's sort of a, you know, Mark, I think, wants solutionism. He wants something today. Um, um, you know, you're building out a new website. You want something, if not today, in the medium, you know, the short to medium term. But then there are also the longer term things like, you know, government funding, um, et cetera. You know, and if we can put stakes in the ground along all of those things, we will accomplish something. I have a suggestion, but I know there's at least two more people running queued up. Well, I had Mark, go. Sam, and Jamie. So yeah. Mark, or Sam, whatever. Uh, I just Sam definitely ahead. Uh, was definitely, I mean, just all along this theme, I think we're, like, in a good, like, trajectory of, like, I don't know, focusing or whatever. And on, mm -hmm. But, like, I was just wondering about scale. Like, I, I don't know, like, I don't even want to put my, like, I don't even know which we're going for, but I kind of wanted to wonder along with all of you, like, are we really talking about, like, creating, like, an alternative to, like, Facebook as a whole? Or are we really looking for more, like, you know, people who even give a shit uh, as to what's mm -hmm. going on, you know, like, because I see all these people on Facebook and they're posting their food and they're this, yeah, this yeah, yeah. shit, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like, I mean, and I'm just speaking for myself now, but like, you know, all I care about is like art and music happenings and like, you know, and, and then it extends to kind of social, like, you know, whatever. There's like, but ultimately I think it's kind of like a small scope about people who actually care. So, you know, I think this is all great that we're getting together and we as an organization are like, Alternatives to Facebook, like fuck Facebook, or really, but like whatever, Facebook can have its thing. Well, we're, what we are really looking for is kind of, I think, a smaller, like, core, like, you know, and I don't want to limit anyone's dreams about, like, we want our, our news to reach, like, countless audience, you know, billions of people. Like, I don't want to tell it, you that it's unrealistic for your news outlets or whatever your story is to reach, like, billions of people, but wouldn't it, wouldn't it, well, sure, yeah, I mean, seriously, though, I mean, I don't want, I don't don't want to tell me, anyone man. that they should it's have, It's about like, knowing what you're on, what do you want to hear? But, you know, I feel like each city, like, and, you know, I love Binge and everything. Like, I, like, as far as I'm concerned, it could be, like, we could all be going towards this, like, nonprofit journalism theme, like, all together. Like, whatever it is, I just think we should maybe, like, consider the focus and, like, you know, like Mark said, but, like, the focus, but also the scale and, and find out really what we're, like, the, other, the community that we're trying to build. Because it can be big and it can include politics and music and all these things, but ultimately, it's, sm I feel like it's a small group of people in the whole world where no one really cares about, they're just living their fucking lives, and then there's like us who actually care about what's going on and want real media from real people who are making it. You know, I mean, that's just, I just want to bring that up as a discussion about focus and scale. Jamie? So, um, I'm gonna try and give an idea that may not be implementable, but I think can, and it's something that could be implemented now. So, um, Mike Masnick of Tech Dirt, you probably haven't heard of him, but he's probably one of the smartest guys when it talks about how the internet is changing business models, um, has 
has basically a, um, you need to connect with your users and you need to give them a reason to buy. That's his little mantra. Um, we're talking about how do we connect with users and how do we get them to fund our newspaper or media or whatever, right? And so, you know, I also think of the Cory Doctorow thing, which is piracy is not your issue, piracy is not your problem, obscurity is your problem, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> for me, looking at over the last seven or more years of how things have changed, we've seen newspapers going towards the <clears throat> like the globe, I hate them because literally I will go in and they'll be like, oh, you had three newspaper articles this month. Pay up some money. And I'm like, really? I have another choice. I can go somewhere else. $27 a month. Right. So, but at the same time, you know, we look at, we look at models like Kickstarter where really you're, you're paying for something to be created. So when you look at a, at a newspaper, don't think about your current article as, I want to get paid for this. And don't necessarily just think about it as it's advertising, but it's a way of connecting with users. And the way you can turn that around is you can say, we have an article, and the Guardian goes at the end and they say, by the way, you like this article? Pony up some money so we can make more. That's a nice model, mm -hmm. um, but if you know if you know you've connected with the users to some degree, you can make personal pitches and you can say, we've noticed you like these sets of articles. We're working on this project. We need $500. You people are people who have clicked on these articles and we also have in our database. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you give us some money? And then when we publish the article, we're gonna put your name. This article was made possible by these people who ponied up the money. And so it's very micro in its focus. And I, you know, as a pirate, it does feel, uh, I don't know, there's privacy implications in my mind. No, I understand. Um, but, at the, but at the same time, you're engaging with people. And it could be in the comments, you could put out, hey, here's a comment, or, or you have its own section we're thinking about these set of things. Vote on which one you'd like to see, and then you follow up with, oh, hey, you know, you like this one? You like this idea? Would you be willing to donate to it? So I, I feel like, you know, the Globe, I go to it, and there's crap for comments. I don't even, I don't, never mind the Herald. I don't, I don't even look at their you comments. You mean digital first media. Yeah. All right. All um, <laughs> But you have to connect with the people and give them a reason to support you. And once they're supporting you, they're going to be, if, if, if people, if some, if you have 10 people who supported an article, or let's say 20 people, and you go and say, hey, we posted the article that you gave money for, they're going to share it. That becomes a point of pride for them. Yeah, and they don't even have to give money for it. Like, what you're talking about is basically get them engaged before it's created. And while right. money is definitely, like, a yes. great way to get people engaged and beneficial to you, even just having them, like, vote on what to cover, which is an idea that most journalists So this hate. is it. This is Harkin. But Harkin yeah. has really perfected yeah. it. Uh, it costs – we are not using them because they will not give us a deal for all of our partners to use it. But at bare minimum, it costs $7,000 a year. It's completely Ooh. unaffordable. Wow. But it is truly outstanding. It is – it is everything from the front end, so basically boxes you can put on for people to vote in, to the crowdfunding part, to the back end is just gorgeous. Um, I don't know how long the video is, but basically. You're here because you've heard about it. It's, 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 it's worth watching. But I just want to show you real quick what one of the things looks like. So look, this would be like, um, if they have one of the things that they built. Uh, I'll find one of the modules, but basically it's everything that you just talked about in one, and you know, frankly, especially after the medium thing and at a cost of $7,000 a year, we're not running to Harkin, I have no beef with them, but uh, we're just looking to do a lot of this stuff on our We're gonna have open notebook, you know, uh, mm -hmm. which can be 30 cents per target. Who's making the profits? Uh, Harkin's a private company. Okay. They're a private what company. What about us yeah. owning the- Well, that's what I'm saying, that's why we're not jumping them. We wanna do a lot of this yeah. stuff, but I'm just saying, if, to look at what should be done, what it should right. really look like, 
what is effective. A good model. Of this, oh, you know, so then wherever you have to, we have to get the tools from to do it. But Harkin has actually done a lot of that, figured out what that what it should look like on the front, what what it's helpful to look like on the back end. And frankly, listen, it's, we don't have to overthink it. Uh, a lot of it really is is voting. Like, what do you, what kind of articles do you want to see in your community? We had a reporter who did a story about the history of the statues <coughs> in Davis Square uh, a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago. This was a story that just went, I call it local viral. I mean, the thing was just shared thousands of times and it just, it really- And we us, got it through our, the person who wrote it came through our working class journalist you know, program which where we here. recruited people. You know? but, but this is the kind of idea, this is the kind of story that yes. people tell you. We will use one, you know, so then you get down to three. What, are the, what public art do you all want to know about? Whatever the most votes are, and just what you said, people were, that was something people were invested in. So they know that story's coming. If they signed up for that, you're hitting them with the email. That's also built into Harkin. So these are all tools that we've talked about over today, I think. And you know, that, well, that's really what the answer is. And you can tie it into your map, whereas like these sections, right. have, we haven't covered right. any of that. That gives someone Absolutely. else an incentive to go in and put another push pin in that area. I mean, one thing we need, you know, to answer people's Finish answering people's question is is essentially a you know a group of technologists that will work with outlets like us in every region you know specifically to help put this stuff together. It's just very difficult. Well, we can't do it. You know, I mean, we have a certain level of technical expertise just to be able to run websites and stuff like that. But that's it. No one's coding, you know, mm -hmm. and doing the heavier lifting uh, or building things that don't exist yet. The other thing we need, you know, um, to go back to the earlier discussion a little bit is. Um, without getting huge, I, I mean, I certainly think this is doable, is essentially, uh, those, many of you may not know that the Associated Press is a cooperative. It actually is, it produces cooperatives, right? Where the different news outlets pay to provide a wire service that they can all benefit from. Well, similarly, I mean, we need, I mean, I hate to say an app because it's cliche and it didn't work when everyone got their own apps, but that's just it. Like, we need something more like a Flipboard, which I like, and that they're, they're kind of conscious company as these companies go, they have about 100 million users. We, we just got on there as publishers. We haven't built an audience there yet. But we need a place where a lot of the independent press, at least in a region, if not nationally or internationally, can, can have their stuff aggregated and have it you know, plug into a lot of, you know, have APIs set up out of it for a lot of other services so that people can really find us you know, like without too much hassle. We're just there, whatever this thing was called, you know, news co-op or whatever it's called. Like, uh, that we'd have an audience ultimately of millions for a lot of the certainly. The I didn't really write every article. It's just, it, messes, it messes it up when pulling it through. What? what, what? It has my name. I don't feel the thing. It has oh, my I'm name sorry. on every article. I'm talking about your website. Yeah, no, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about flipboard. 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 I'm sorry. Pardon me. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know you did something prolific. I have a question um, related to the uh, idea of what you're talking about. I mean, we have these associations that, for better or worse, are doing an okay job whether it's the uh, Alternative News Association or Lion or INN, um, what, you know, like what about, I mean, ha have they had this kind of discussion and or could we help, could a bunch of us in all different places around the country encourage like at some convention that they're all gonna be at, like to talk to each other because it, what you're talking about, it totally makes sense. It could, because I think creating another million other teeny places, you know, as opposed to like one big place, at the same time as we get like the people in the room who know how to do stuff to make us a free heart, and that would be awesome. <laughs> but um, like, ha has that kind of discussion well, happened? This this event today, at least from my, you know, we mean it. We mean for this to be. Um, like to, a a, we want to have a conference in the fall, you know, uh, on these issues, but larger, you know, with a couple hundred people, three hundred people, that kind of stuff with maybe some travel budget that we could put together so we get more people from out of town. What, and you know, we're also, as I said, it looks like our papers, uh, Dig Boss is gonna be the host for the next conference of our independent newspaper trade association, the, the Association of Alternative News Media, which obviously is porous to groups like the local independent online news publishers you know, group and network that, that Lion that you mentioned earlier, uh, ONA, the Online News Association and others. I mean, they're, they're, uh, and then the Society of Professional Journalists, um, you know, their staff is watching us right now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so um, uh, at, at the regional level, I think. Um, so, um, yeah, that more. would be well, great. Did, did you have anything Sorry. about INN? Uh, uh, I really wanted to share my proposal, but oh, yeah. I wasn't sure that Jay finished his thought about Jamie's thought. Oh, right. Did you get oh. that out? Uh, thank you, yes. Okay. Uh, so I really like that. Okay, I'm excited that there could be a, like a, a framework with 
well within which that works. Uh, I think Sam has a great answer with the wrong solution, and I think you guys maybe have the solutions. Uh, the calendar. The I, I think the calendar is essential. I think the calendar is so important to almost everything that everyone, every journalist here does, uh, and should be potentially more important. But Google Calendar is kind of terrible, terrible, and I hate working with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Google's a bunch of dumbasses, because <laughs> like years ago, I went to them and tried to get them interested in some of these ideas. It's been a long road. Google, Yahoo, the Knight Foundation, it's been really frustrating. Google. You can do they a month view, too, for what it's worth. Where? Google, um, sorry? Top right oh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So it's Google had something called Google Plus. You may recall. Yeah. It's still around, barely. Sure, it's still around. That's 100 cool. million users are here. <laughs> so I told them that they should really um, try to That's make it uh, more of an events platform. Yeah. And I gave them this example. We have the Middle East. The Middle East now has five stages. Those five stages might have two events a day. Those two events might have four bands on a bill. Each of those bands is made up of one to seven people, they, by focusing on events, by, by encouraging people to create events using their Google Plus pages, they in, would encourage people to create Google Plus accounts. If you guys have calendars on your platform, as well as aggregating news, you have the potential to compel people to create users and to have them live within that environment. Sure. They're looking at news from all around the place. They're looking ca at calendar events from around the place. Mm -hmm. If you get buy-in <coughs> from enough of the independent sources, it's a Boston Compass event, it's a Boston Calendar event, mm -hmm. whatever, and, and independently made events, you can potentially aggregate a lot of people on that site. Mm -hmm. And that map just pulls out and out and out to the entire United States and entire world eventually. Newspapers used to know what they were doing. They used to be huge and have these different categories, and everyone went to that one newspaper for all those different categories. That's all we're talking about. <coughs> and I'm not opposed to the model that Facebook followed and all the other <coughs> unicorns followed of building mass, and then when you have the eyes, then you start doing advertising. And that's all newspapers ever did anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so if you guys have the bandwidth. The content for them. Right, right. Facebook creates no content. It's just taking other people. We, exactly. built this, we all built that. Yeah. So to be really clear, I mean, the reason why most people go to Facebook most of the time is not for the content. No, it's for connections. Exactly. Yeah. And so uh, I think it's uh, a, a real like potential pitfall in thinking is to think that we can create a Facebook for journalism, whatever that might look like, and that that will succeed on its own or be something that will have the reach of Facebook or that Facebook could provide but is now right. paying for, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in, in general, you have this kind of challenge <coughs> of the switching costs from Facebook to anything else is huge. And if you're going to get people to switch, at the very least, you have to have something that is as good as what they're already using and then the pain has to be so great for that other platform that they are looking for an alternative. The only other way to get people to switch from an established uh, player, a, a monopolist essentially, uh, is to be multiple, multiple times better, 10x times better. Mm -hmm. um, or in a totally different space that isn't really switching costs at all, provide something that the platform doesn't that people actually want and need. Um, and I think that's where there's an opportunity for a lot of um, people who are at that intersection of content and technology, journalism and technology, start thinking about, okay, we're not going to be the platform for social connections with our peers. Uh, we have this background in content, but do people just want to consume content? I don't think they do. They want to do something else. And so what else that still fits within your organization's mission can you let your readers no longer just be these passive readers, but right. doers. Exactly. Right. And so with the events calendar, that's a great option of, you know, let me create events, let me vote on events, let me find things that I can do at these events that have reflection in it. Um, it's the same thing that you were saying earlier with the, the Harkin thing and being able to uh, contribute to get the content created that I want created. Um, 
for an arts and music thing, you know, it, I don't know, I don't have that answer, on, unfortunately, but like, you have to have something that people can do other than just consume uh, if you want to really get an active engaged and have that repetition and build the habit uh, to where you don't have to rely on whatever other platform they have the habit on. Right. Yeah. Um, just on what Matt had said earlier, um, in 1996, I started a community that was for chatting, I was building chat software for this company I worked at right in Cambridge. Um, we had over 300,000 users. We were getting two and a half million hits a day. <laughs> And as you said, um, I don't want to be the babysitter for this giant <laughs> <laughs> thing of whatever. So I started a magazine out of it for the people who were using the website. And I put it in the hands of the people. So people who had been instigators, people who had been writing to me about a feature they wanted or things like that, I asked them if they'd wanted uh, a column in this magazine. Soon I had an online, it was at magazinerack.com, which is no longer there anymore, mm -hmm. it's something corporate. <laughs> um, but uh, I had 20 writers doing an article every week and tons and tons of readers. Um, the, the putting it in the hands of the people is really what's important because they want to do this. People don't care if they're paid, they, they want to further this thing along. So. This, it was a very eclectic magazine rack, and everyone took their topic. And out of that spawned sub-magazines. Out of that spawned real-life meetings in real time where they would rent out a hotel for a weekend and have a, a theme based on the chat room. So, and it, it just grew and grew and grew. Unfortunately, the people who were uh, paying for all of this really didn't like it. This <laughs> they, thought <it> <laughs> they thought it was a waste of time and, and all of that and kind of trashed it. Now, while they were trashing it, what they were doing was they were not rebooting servers when they needed to, making it dysfunctional pretty much and almost to a point doing that actively. What happened was another company came along, started a chat site, and it was they had a little better, a little this, a little that, and uh, people went there you could not get them away from there, even with all the mistreatments they were getting there. It, like people would, I would get inbox full in the morning of complaints about this other place. Oh. <laughs> 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 it was totally flipped. And then it just flew into the gutter from there because it had no, no wind behind the sails. But trying to get someone off of a disreputable platform is one of the hardest things I have ever ever seen and it's inconscionable. People see the whole list of what they're doing to you and they still run over there. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's, uh, anybody well, think it's uh, uh, hurt? Because that's where all their friends are. Too hot? Oh, right. That's they have this something like LO where it's like a, almost it's becomes a joke. Uh, they're, it's really the hot for the moment. Is that maybe not the way to go? Uh, I don't maybe know. Maybe have something not so cool. <coughs> hey, let's just do this little five. And, and Jay's point about quit switching costs is well taken. I mean, our backing yeah. off Facebook in the last two months has cost us 13% of our, of our viewers. More on, on, first, the, right? on the one what? It was more at first even, right? A little bit, but I mean, we, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, most of our audience is still in print, believe it or not. Yeah, I can't you know, 40, 50,000 people. But we're trying to rebuild or build for the first time a digital presence that's more robust. Yeah. But so we could afford that. Most people can't, most outlets can't afford that's to lose what could be 50 or 60% of their audience. Good. I mean, if you want to press Facebook on one thing that would help destabilize it, press it on the ability to export your social graph. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you can export your social graph and move it somewhere else, yeah. yes. you've already you've already <laughs> empowered that other place far more. Um, I'll send you DVDs of everything you've ever posted. <laughs> 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 can't, can't, you, can't you export your social graph? I used to be able to no. export it. What is no. social graph? Um, your, All your connections, your everything connection. you posted, uh, just everything that you kind of added in. Okay. Right. <laughs> you, you know, the thing is, I think though what Matt's say, saying is a little more closer, rather than like, I don't think of people switching from Facebook to something else. I think like, you own your platform, you own your content, you own your community, you own what it is you're bringing people to, and there's going to always be other platforms. Right. I mean, the tweens I'm with, they're on Snapchat, and they're on something <laughs> else, and mm -hmm. international folks are on WhatsApp, and so like, I think like, mm -hmm. you have to have the ability though to, to pull not let that thing be the thir the thing that's your gateway to your people. Mm -hmm. Like you you bring in the people. Like I'm going out to the square and I'm going to draw you into my shop. 
right here here's my flyer come to my shop come hang out with me for a while and so like I feel like and then you can always be flexible about what platform you're pulling people in from and if you build enough of a great experience for people whether it's a you, they're paying you or you're doing an NPR like fund me or you create some great like I see a lot of digital journalists creating events in their communities like come and hang out at this micro place and mm -hmm. you know the event pays for the journalism so like I, I feel like if you create that place that like the vibe and what they like and what you're offering and their belonging and you're engaging with them and you're communicating with them and you've created the space and I'm connected to these other and then you're talking about like federating up with other journalists and then you get that mass of other folks you can then say like well let's crowdsource for this platform that we want to build this open source harken yeah right so because now we're like you know, a hundred pla a hundred outlets that want to like pool our resources and say, Bill, I can never get the public access media people to do that. Like mm -hmm. they have a set funding coming through regulation, and they can never seem to like put money aside to fund something for everybody. But um, so I feel like there's those kinds of things. Like it's about developing that, and 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 there's always going to be another platform. I just can't see how you're going to get. Yeah, you know, like, whose grandma is going to switch from them? Mm -hmm. the yeah, I mean, I just don't. I think it's a lot, like, I'm just not going to, I can't, yeah. Sure, I, but I, grandma, I, yeah. grandma does search on Google. If there's something right. going on in the community, she'll search. Yeah. She'll find an article from some local news producer. If that article leads her in some way to Binge's new platform, yeah. where there are events, yeah. where she can create a user and then comment on something. Right, so like, so she'll, yeah, so I feel like that too. Like, so she, then she's coming to you through Google. At some point, you know, who knows what Google will do in the future with its... <laughs> Right, so like, but that ability to pull in people from multiple places, browsers, just reminded platforms. me of Ning. Ning was like, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was just, yeah. At, at the beginning of all the Anon stuff, way back when, in 08 there, like 10 years ago, uh, everyone had one of these for their local city, and that's how they were building out their local organizations yep. until Ning went, you know, hey, oh. and killed everything. But when it was free, uh, that's what everyone was using to build out their local social networks. I wanted to bring up, you know, the alternative models that are out there now. Yeah. Like, so there's the paywalls, you know, like the Globe. You go there, you're on your third article, suddenly they want money, right? But uh, one of the ones that's really been interesting <coughs> to me for the last like, five years has been Decorrespondent, which is a Norwegian uh, publication. <coughs> and see they crowdfunded it. originally and see got, uh, yeah, uh, uh, see, yeah, Correspondent, yeah, there it is. And they crowdfunded originally, got 1.7 million euro uh, in their crowdfund. Uh, but um, they're like the stars of the journalism world. Right? Yeah, yeah, because they're doing a, they're doing the English version now. If you go there, you can sign up for the mailing list for when the English one actually comes out. But what they did is they got a bunch of like real experts. Like if you weren't a college professor of, uh, at Oxford, you weren't going to be writing for them. Mm -hmm. And they went and got that level of person to write and the money to do it through the crowdfunding, of course. And then they closed it. You can't get to their articles. Uh, this is all you're going to see. There, there's no articles to read. Uh, and instead of a paywall where you see a few articles, if you're a paying member at seven uh, euro a month, uh, you can share up to three articles a month. And anyone who goes and views it can't get anywhere. They see like a like if anyone knows reader view when you're viewing only the text, you see something like that of their article and it's wonderful. And you can see the names of all the experts who are commenting because like if, if it's an article on physics, every single person who works at CERN has commented already. Like that's the crowd they've got. And so it makes you kind of this um, real interesting person to your friends if you're the one sharing it out. You know, it makes you something special in your in your social graph. I love the idea of not being able to see a single word a single word yeah. on the website until you sign up for the email. There's 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 nothing here, but now they're up to over sixty thousand paying people at seven uh, seven euro a month now. That's great. And it's simply because the quality of their stuff is that good, and when someone shares it out, everyone around them can see how smart they are by being. And you know that, that's literally what they're doing. That's the mechanic they're using. I recommend to anybody see this thing right here, and we're quoted in it, but it's not uh, membership puzzle project. Uh, but they, uh, Dakar, there's a lot about them, uh, the correspondent in there. But um, I recommend anybody reading this. I'll look it yeah. up. Yeah, um, it, it 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 really breaks down a lot of the stuff we've talked about and different options. Do you have any others that come come to mind? No, I, this this is actually the a great way to kind of understand what what they did there. So this this will explain. There's a couple thing. big medium posts that explain everything the de correspondent did to kind of get launched right. and you know how they lured in a lot of the bigger academics to, to help write for them. Right. So a lot of the stuff we talked about would be useful I think, for some people. Check this out. This is a great study. Uh, sorry, a couple. You have Jane and Paul. Um, yeah, I, I had a couple of things, um, and I'll 
try to wrap them up quick, but yeah, one thing is like, um, you know, everybody here is kind of like a, a conscious consumer in a sense, you know, like yes. we're actually thinking about what we're <laughs> using and who's taking from us as we use those things and what we're giving them for free and all of that kind of thing. And, you know, right now, I mean, with all of the Facebook's issues, you know, we have a, almost a duty, I think, to sort of reiterate that message ourselves and, you know, try to convince the rest of us that aren't paying attention to this kind of thing that it really is important and that, um, you know, each of us individually has to be a little more conscious in our lives and, and invested in it and think about what we're doing and how, where we're sharing our information and, and what services we're using and what, you know, what we're building for others for free. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, even, even messages that are being said, like, you know, one person has said, you know, it's hard to get off Facebook because of the things you miss out on. And it's like, you know, don't think of it that way. I and mean, don't put that message out there. Think about the time you save not going on Facebook. You can go and see those kids. You know, and Emma said it's kind of the same thing <coughs> earlier. Um, and, um, you know, and, and additionally, like you had said, you know, Facebook is not search, search engine optimization. Yes, plenty of things that happen in journalism are going to be discussed and are going to be, um, you know, brought up a little bit better in terms of what how they appear on search engines. But don't forget that there is that as a main <coughs> venue to your content as well. Um, and you know, the more that any of us continue to be on Facebook, the more motivation we continue to leave there for people to continue to go. Mm -hmm. um, so don't you know. It's like, you know, um, I could litter because, you know, I'm not, I'm one person, I'm not going to make that big of a difference, you know. I could have that thought or I can have, I'm not going to be part of that, um, you know, and try to continue that message like that, um, you know, that I don't make a difference isn't like the license for me to contribute to the problem instead. Um, very <laughs> pleasant, <laughs> 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 though. Um, yeah, and um, for the last, the last thing, I guess that's most of what I wanted to say. But the last thing was, in terms of the Harkin, there, there could actually already be something in the platform cooperativism space, and I would definitely double check the directory at io.coop to see if people are actually working on that right now, because that is the type of thing <laughs> that you know are are being aggregated there specifically journalists getting together and forming a cooperative that they, you know, decide what features are necessary for journalists to have a platform to publish and to interact and so on. So it's a perfect place to, to do that. And um, finally, I know that, you know, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that anything can be fixed on Facebook. I'm kind of in the, you know, um, Buckminster mindset of rebuilding and, um, Unfortunately, we're going to have to do some technology stuff, and I definitely hear what you're saying in terms of the difficulties. And the left forum, which is coming up <coughs> early next mm -hmm. uh, early next month, there will be another uh, another tech convergence occurring there, uh, mm -hmm. which is a very similar event to this, where you know activists and, and people that have been in the in in the actions for a long time, um, you know, kind of get together with the techno technologists and help the technologists understand what are the, what are the problems. What, what things do need solutions? What, um, yes. you know, where where are the pain points, and how can we, you know, get past them? And what do act, what do technologists need to know about about the whole thing too? So yes. why isn't that's it that's easy for you? Yes, right. that's what we need to. <laughs> it's we hard need to, to hear from you lots. <laughs> I'm eager to see Facebook become just cat photos and pictures of kids <laughs> and that sort yeah. of thing, <laughs> and yes. to remove all the news and event maybe and you know, some of the events and have it be elsewhere but it's not practical for me to get off Facebook until some other ecosystem exists. Yeah, I'd love you to first, get me first. All right, um, I just wanted to oh, sorry, say one sorry. last thing about you were talking about alternative models or you know ways of funding journalism and 
Um, I think we're forgetting that one way of funding journalism is actually being done by some of the older organizations around. You mentioned the AP, but we've got the CBC and the BBC, and for sure. all the, the distrust and you know hatred that I have for the man or the woman who's in charge <laughs> of running whatever country that uh, I'm living or working in, um, it's, there is the whole argument that's made by people like John Nichols and Bob McChesney that um, news and journalism is a public good. It's similar to the stuff that, I forgot to say, I used to be head of SCAT TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right. I knew it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's similar <laughs> to the idea of public access television. And so, and I know that some people here are focused like maybe less on politics and news and more on arts and this kind of, this kind of thing. But I think that um, if you care about democracy and care about your communities, mm -hmm. it does make sense to be active in your local community in politics, no matter how much you hate it, because it does make a difference. And we've seen really interesting progressive people arrest, uh, arrested, elected, both, both, elected. Like in Somerville, and a couple days ago, they had this incredible vote, and now they're going to go to the state level um, to try to get this tax. A thing put in for when real estate changes hands between certain parties. There's a tax levy. That money goes for affordable housing. It's completely conceivable that in some future, maybe before Saul and me and yes, some of elders here die, yeah, <laughs> that there could be at a local level there could be money yeah. that that you know goes towards some fund that funds public that funds public interest journalism the yes. way yeah. the money goes to, to pay for SCAT TV or Lowell. I mean. The so Somerville gets a huge amount of money from the two cable companies there, and it actually hasn't started to fall off yet because while we do have the cord cutters and the younger people, they're building high rises, and there's people who like ESPN, and so there's still this steady flow, this pump of money coming in from the cable companies. Well, guess what? A lot of it goes to City Hall, and that's to fund the big PR machine out of City Hall. Mm -hmm. And a teeny bit goes to like government covering the city council meetings and, and to public access and to covering the sports game. There's that could be changed. If you can get control of City Hall, or the same thing in Cambridge, you could have less go to the PR machines, and then some go to some fund. I mean, it's supposedly a democracy. We know it's not, but there are still some elements that are not under total corporate control. And I say local is the way to do it. This guy, Simon, yes. has a great idea. We're doing check, it. Check this out every time. This guy, Simon, says one way to do it, community information districts. Uh, basically, oh, I think I've read about that. Yeah, he's I was just on my phone looking for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I'd just like to say we're doing this. Um, has anyone heard of a local organization called Ujima? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the first yes. thing that came up when I looked it up. Aaron Tanaka, those folks. Yeah. Ujima, Boston. Yep. Um, right. They're doing some wonderful things um, along with there's the greater UJIMA right? UJ yeah. project. Ujima, yeah. Boston. Yes. And uh, no, so much going we worked. Um, with a lot of people, but um, specifically we've worked to get a woman named Lydia Edwards is a Boston oh. City Councilor, and she is amazing. Um, she's also part of a group we started over a year ago called the Greater Boston Chamber of Cooperatives, and this is a group that um, gets things done for cooperatives to exist. Like we met with City Hall, and are they are now changing the process when you apply to create a corporation or a business instead of just an LLC and a corporation B or whatever, they will now be having a choice of cooperative. Mm -hmm. So that's like a major hurdle that we came over because mostly we found people weren't forming cooperatives because they didn't know what they were, they didn't know how to do it, they didn't know it was possible. But now there is this <laughs> engine behind it and also Ujima Boston is we're discussing and forming a media cooperative, which um, is cool. just starting to take form now. The discussions are happening. Um, we have an arts and culture committee or group. I don't like the word committee, but um, you know that they get nothing done. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, we've had a couple of meetings so far as to what to do to bring the arts and pol politics and learning and all of this together to be a more meaningful thing. And they put their money where their mouth is. Just quickly, they, uh, a few weeks ago, they brought 13 different companies 
cooperatives, small companies together to meet with Boston Children's Hospital to become a long-term relationship vendors. Hmm. Boston Children's Hospital has made a huge commitment to having uh, local vendors and long-term relationships, which is huge, because now a mom and pop company can get in there and supply the baked goods, or you know, it's not just Dunkin' Donuts in the corridors of the mm -hmm. hospital. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I suggest joining or looking at groups like that and uh, getting people to into those is of major importance because these are things we're group deciding and it's just wonderful. It's a whole new free atmosphere. Um, yeah, that's the business model how they see are there it happening. Meetings planned yet? Um, it's Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night they have an open community meeting and it's in um, Jamaica Plain. To bring kids. Yeah. Yes, and there's dinner. I will say, um, free lunch. we did um, with Open Media Boston. Um, I did try the to found a cafe. It's in the same building as the Ula Cafe. Um, I did try to found an Open Media co-op for over a year. Okay, back in 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Did not work, right? Um, people did not seem interested in paying for their own news, for news to be produced, at least that they didn't directly control. Because we still have to have that kind of church-state separation mm -hmm. between the business side and the editorial side. If you're trying to do, you know, an independent news outlet, at least, right? That's the model we were looking for, right? Um, so just, I'd be, I'd be interested to talk more about this attempt to at start a media co-op. Yes. It's, it, its aims may be somewhat different too, but it was difficult. And then there's been this like Banyan project that they've been trying to do, uh, you know, a paper up in Haverhill for like ten years, and I don't even think it's launched. Or if it has, it's very minimal. So it's it's a tough model for news. Although, although that that we're in a different world now, Jason, than when you were doing Open Media Boston. We're now yes. in this like nightmare world. Of <laughs> fast we were then. Nightmare. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that there's, you know, I just think that there's, I think that a, a lot of things have changed, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that people are people who most people still don't pay attention to the news. But mm -hmm. I think that those who sort of started paying attention to it now are like, oh shit, there are no local <laughs> papers left. Oh shit, look what happened in Washington. Oh shit, blah blah blah. So I, I think it's worth it. They are. I can speak. I can speak from the as the pro, the main binge fundraiser. In addition, to all the other stuff on the journalism side is that you know Trump just murdered us for local journalism. Two thousand seven, mm -hmm. we raised more money in the first half of this year than we did all of all of uh, two thousand seventeen. I mean. Uh, it was just really, you know, everybody wants to give that money to ProPublica so that when they're out to dinner after the president is oh. impeached, they can brag about it, yeah. you know. Um, uh, but, you know, we've gotten back, but it's been a lot of messaging. Uh, somebody mentioned, maybe Gina, uh, about just, uh, I think a few people, that, that education. I know it, and I know a lot of you read the big and binge. We, you know, Jason and I are just constantly hammering this away. I think even that it, both of us wrote, wrote about the medium situation for this week, but it's yep. more than that. We're, you know, not just on Facebook. I, I write, I read at least one column every six months, telling people like you know to share, reminding them to share our articles, local articles. It's almost like it's not cool. You know, people would rather share something like embarrassing, like oh look, I'm watching the royal wedding, yeah. than share a freaking local news story, which they read. Which they read, you know, so it's, it's a, I think a lot of it. they judged on their politics. And, you, know, you guys have a friends. really cool, yeah, I mean, you guys have a really cool community. So, that, I mean, I hope that you, I mean, you get a lot of traction off that when I see your guys mm -hmm. stuff shared. And, you know, that's, and I asked about a thunderclap before. I didn't mean to get too uh, technical, but thunderclap, those who know what it is, it's basically like, it's, you know, one time. A nonprofit can get, nonprofits use it a lot, and you can get people to sign up, and then you can blast out one tweet, and it'll, you get access to everybody's Twitter account for that one tweet, mm -hmm. and it blasts it out across the board. Well, you know, for us and something like you guys, especially, if you had your all of your volunteers that you could pull the trigger on it, on a tweet on all of them for every single time, I mean, it would just be invaluable. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of like direct tools that I think that would work right away. For some reason, we don't get a lot of traction on like the Twitter. Like, I think we're gonna start. We have a, we create a lot of content with the events and the newspaper, obviously, our own stuff and other people's stuff. But I think we're gonna go in more of like a journalism direction with the Twitter, where like we're posting like the articles because they. I don't know, it just seems like that's a more place for journalists or something, but our events just fall flat on Twitter for what it's worth. I use Twitter like constantly, and 11 years of tweeting, the one thing they got the most views ever was a picture of Skeletor. Yeah. <laughs> they got one right. and a half million views Skeletor. in like two days. Yeah. Oh, and so, like, you just, there is no yeah. rhyme or reason about like no, what may or may not get sorry. seen. And there's so much stuff being posted that, like, 
<coughs> I have been, and I'm sorry if I've unfollowed anyone by mistake, but like I've really had to get my followers, people I follow down to like about 300 people hmm. to That's actually find for. Twitter <coughs> meaningful. That's what lists are for. Mm. It's too many clicks and it's like shitty on the I know. Were you in on the buy Twitter movement? What's that? Um, well, the same people that started the platform cooperativism, we started a movement to buy Twitter and have it be owned. Oh, I don't want to buy Twitter. It's, um, That's the worst idea. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cooperative platform that we own. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I worry that we might be using the same terms for different things, like the media collaborative or cooperative has been said a lot, and I'm not sure if they all are supposed to be working the same or if people have different ideas about that. Yes, um, A technological approach that uh, I, this is what I was trying to get started for a long time, um, and maybe this is the right place. Uh, so the concept of sharing fearlessly, which is basically Rosen's thing, is that Rosen's thing? Yeah, Jay Rosen, yeah. Um, I do feel like we can do that more fearlessly and better um, if we get the numbers the same way that YouTube and Vimeo get the numbers. A story can go any number of places, but we always know how many clicks that writer is getting, that story is getting, no matter where it's posted. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there would be a lot less fear about sharing content um, if we had that little metadata embedded in some yeah. platform. It, as, as the story goes through the platform, it gets that metadata. Back in the 90s, the National Writers Union, when I was director of the Boston Book, had proposed a, a stamp, you know, like exit data on a photo or whatever that goes along with the, you know, with the document, um, where, you know, with the, whatever it is, right? What, whatever kind of media it is, um, wherever it's shared and stuff like that, and is therefore trackable in some sense. I, I don't know of anybody that really followed up on that, but there's a company called repost.us yeah, that really oh, did it. And then it died because oh, they didn't have any journalists on their board. They hmm. <laughs> I'll tell you something that. else is that we talked to somebody recently, a friend we know from the media consortium, another group of uh, it's like the that's like the nation, Mother Jones at the top of the food chain, binge at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> basically, um, and, and the, you pretty soon you're gonna be seeing the Guardian and even like places like the Boston Globe sharing paywall. So I'm um, using blockchain. Mm -hmm. So if the locals don't blockchain. get our shit together, uh, people suddenly who don't have, don't get me started. Blockchain is not the future of journalism. <laughs> uh, I but, don't know but that. Yeah, I do know that. Uh, uh, in this okay. room, so. What? So? Yes. He has the shame of being the first one to say blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> we all have well, well, that, well, that is what it's based on, and I guess that would obviously be important for those big companies to be shared, especially for anybody. But you know, so but what I'm saying is basically like. We better figure out if we're gonna, if anybody's gonna be, if there's ever gonna be paywalls involved and stuff like that, you better be able to use the same one for Cambridge Day and Dorchester Report. Um, be, you know, like a community pass across the greater Boston region, or else, you know, because yeah, right a now, idea. I love the fact right now that, that, I mean, nothing better for me than the flow being behind a paywall for, for the day. Yeah, I know. Are you kidding? I, I, we, we operate as if they do not exist because they don't. Yes. Except when we attack them relentlessly. Except for, yeah, yeah they, <laughs> they, they, in the negative they exist. Yeah. Uh, that's beautiful. So is that idea a non-starter, are you saying? It just Which, the, the one I mentioned earlier? The exit data, the, the metadata. It was that the writers union didn't have the tech people really to, to, to push it, and they kept trying for structural solutions of the type that was criticized earlier, with some good reason, you know, rather than the more practical solutions. Um, and, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> Matt, you want oh, I mean, on the same thing, like, at Creative Commons, we tried really hard to get, like, exit data and embed license stuff in those <laughs> things. Mm -hmm. and. It actually harkens to Facebook a little bit. A big issue for Facebook, what well, for YouTube users right now is, you can download a YouTube video, any YouTube video in, in, a, in a second, and just stick it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And Facebook does not respect <coughs> like take down notices from like people on YouTube. Mm -hmm. so you have like big YouTube creators, <laughs> their videos get hijacked, just stuck on Facebook oh. by some stranger. Yep. And they get millions of views on Facebook, and they're getting paid. <laughs> literally copying someone's work and so the, yeah. moment, the moment you put something like a picture on Facebook with exit data they will pull that stuff out they, they, they you know remove any kind of metadata you upload there so they're, they're intentionally removing any kind of trackable or stackable yeah. thing you could add to your own work wow. I'm still hoping so we it's can illegal there is, it's like illegal I mean, right? Am I dumb or what? If well, there yeah, were laws, you know. Right, right, <laughs> On the massive scale, but like, yeah, you, Facebook don't care. They just don't do anything about it. Well, they're not the ones doing it. 
foot, they should at least take them down. Oh, I'm not arguing that. Ever. Right, right, right. I want to make it clear that they're not the ones I, reposting. See, but this is Jaron Lanier's. stripping the metadata. Yeah. Th this is Jaron Lanier's. Facebook does. Facebook does that. Yeah. Yeah. This guy, Jaron Lanier, you know, one of the sort of net grandfathers or whatever, you know, like, um, has been talking about this for years. Um, he has a book, You Are Not a Gadget, that came out several years ago that kind of talks about the fact that the internet could have been built so that people were making micropayments for creators' work, which would have, yeah, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> would have been nice, I guess. I, mean, I don't know if people really would have done it or not, but, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, Ted Nelson proposes that in his initial book about hypersex in the 60s, right? Yeah, right, that's so right. You go to like a local burger bar, right? yeah. you go to an information bar, and you read news in a kiosk, and you yeah. pay 10 cents for privilege. And right? Heinlein and other techno libertarians had this trip, this kind it's, of trip, yeah. like forever, yeah, it's true. But I mean, it is something that, you know, it was a road not traveled, whether you can put the genie back in the bottle now, where people just expect stuff for quote-unquote free is always the, the big question. Yeah, someone had their hand up? Yeah. I mean, Sorry. you're sitting here talking about surveillance systems and digital rights right. management. And, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't, I mean, I, I don't know what the solution is, um, but in other contexts, I think we all hate surveillance systems and digital rights management. Right. So we should be conscious of, you know, every time you say track, that's surveillance. And, mm -hmm. right. you know, mm -hmm. exifs and metadata, et cetera, you know, that, that's... It was meant to be a grassroots well, thing, though, yeah. right? Not, it wasn't meant to... I know, I know. Well, so. we want our content to be valued, and we want to be able to share. Yeah. And I, the only way to do that is if we are, you know, we're getting credit for what we're putting <coughs> out there. I understand that. Te technology is not inherently evil, right? No. Like, cameras aren't evil. It's video surveillance is. It's the use of the technology that we're objecting against, not the inherent <coughs> technology itself. And no, you do have to be careful, as a technology creator, to try and foresee ways in which what you're creating can be abused and try to build in safeguards against it, right. which I think goes well, more and, and I think we've got two points here as well. Like, we've got people, like, on one hand, there's a, a, you know, a desire to have a, a society that functions and all the information good that, that we want to have this functioning you know, democracy, lack of a better word. Um, but at the same time, we also have people who need to make a living. You know, you're producing yep. things you want to get paid for it. And that's not a bad thing that, you know, that pays your rent, that feeds you, um, and that's, you know, you, know, you <coughs> could pay your taxes with it, also it might be good for democracy. Th these sorts of things are all connected. And so when we talk about it, it's really important not to, to have them be opposed to each other. But they have to coexist. But all the implementations are. I mean, every digital rights management thing tends to obscure fair use. Um, and turns, <coughs> you know, I mean, I would gladly pay you if you if you put up a paywall, you know, for Cambridge Day. I even pay for the Globe because if, if they want to be paid for their news and I want to read it, you know, that that's my contract with society. I mean, I give you guys money too. I mean, it, it does. I'm fortunate yeah. enough to be able to, you know, do that. Um, and, I mean, I understand that you want, I mean, there need, there's a need for payment, et cetera, but the technology solutions in this space you know, are universally bad yeah. um, that they, in the sense that they abrogate people's rights. And if we're going to think about re-implementing them, you need to think about them, uh, that everybody has rights in this space. I have fair use rights to, you know, share some part of your articles. Um, that's, you know, that's part of the copyright, you know, um, social contract. Um, and, um, the systems that are built to do this, like the you know automated takedown systems that spew notices everywhere, right. just don't care about that. And Ignoring. Sorry. No, I was gonna say it's really important. I think that we understand that there is no such thing as free. You know, we talk about oh, it's free to read this news. It's right. free to deal with this content. That's not true. You're paying. You're paying in some way. Okay. Whether it's in the olden days, we looked at banner ads that were annoying, but fine. You know, we made the agreement that that was okay. Yeah. But now all this free content is costing us a lot. Yeah. Costs us our election. Okay, for real. So stop thinking that news is somehow a public service. It's not. These are journalists. They're professionals. They're making a living. There's nothing wrong with paying for this content. How many people in here have Netflix? You're willing to pay to be entertained, not you personally, okay, but I'm yeah. saying the world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, yes. we're willing to pay to be entertained, but we're not willing to pay to be informed, and that's bull, and that's all of our own fault. I think if, you, if you're if you on Twitter a lot, which unfortunately I am now for, for this new project, I'm on there a lot more than I ever was, and it's, it's 
been really eye opening. But <laughs> all the tech people, the writers, the the funders, the you know the guilty billionaires, um, they are okay. talking about you know this is a time. So this is a moment in time. It's way beyond this room. People are talking about this now. <coughs> Startups and businesses and even social movements succeed because of a moment in time. Um, so it's it's happening right now. So. I just want everyone to remember that free doesn't actually exist. There's no such thing. No. So, I mean, one point I just want to make, as someone who's a pirate, is the internet is a <laughs> copying machine. I'm, I'm sorry, it's never going to be harder to copy, right? And so, so you're right. Someone can take a YouTube video, and it's never going to be harder going forward to share that. You know, it's you're right. People do pay for YouTube pay for Netflix and yep. Hulu and whatever. Mm -hmm. But they also use BitTorrent or the new streaming, new pirated streaming services Ooh. to get that content as well. There, so you know, pe people will get it however they can and if they can't pay for it, well, they're gonna use other ways. And there are people throughout the world who cannot pay for it in the US and other countries, whatever. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, as I brought up before, the problem is not piracy, the problem is obscurity, right? And if you can get people to your site and you can engage them and you can give them a reason that they should support you, they will. Like the, the you know, the, the example that, one of the examples I like is there was this guy, right? And he made a graphic novel, it was a great graphic novel. And you know, he got mentioned on Boing Boing and he noticed there was a spike and of <coughs> people buying it. Oh, that's great. And then suddenly there was this spike. He said, where did that come from? It was on 4chan. There was someone who loved his, um, loved his graphic novel and had diligently scanned in every single one and was putting it up on Fortran. Now he could have done, gone and done a DMCA notice and said, oh, you gotta take that yeah, thing yeah. down. He didn't. He went there, he engaged with people, and suddenly there were more people who wanted to buy his graphic novel and get a physical copy. Right, this and is the yes. bands don't make money selling albums, they make money touring sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. Well, they, so. they've never made money selling albums unless they were the top, you know, 100, right? You know, YouTube will make money, but they're, it's not just that they're established, but they've worked the system. There are lots of bands that have existed that have never made money except through touring and merchandise. So that's never changed. Right. The question is, there are now more opportunities for people to find out about the music they could potentially love. And so putting in digital yeah. rights management uh, or tracking isn't going to help artists. It's going to create another middleman who's going to extract as much profits from that as possible. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll start. The only Sorry. reason I want to track that is so that we know where the content is going. When we know how broadly the content is being used, then uh, there are people who will want to piggyback on that. Like with Repos did, if an ad comes along with uh, an article or a columnist or whatever that gets used widely, uh, that's a benefit. That makes the money. And I understand that there are ways to abuse EXIF and metadata and all that, but that's all I'm looking for. Like, like ads get attached to YouTube videos. That was the only concept. I think just to clarify, we're talking about analytics versus tracking. Right. Tracking sounds evil and scary and dangerous. Yeah. Analytics <coughs> is just like, who read my thing? Right. How many views did I get? Yeah. How many yeah. hits? Yes. Where are they from? Broad, that, that kind of broad analytics. That's a great distinction. If it's not <laughs> given to Google, if you run your own analytics, which you can do, I think is quite powerful. If Google Analytics shouldn't be, you shouldn't give Google that information. You should have it yourself. You should host your own analytics. Words, yeah. words matter. You say, who read my thing? Yeah. That's tracking and surveillance. That's not analytics. How many people read my thing? That's analytics. Um, I mean, and as soon as you get into the demography, you're in into the world where you're trading your personal data as payment for something you perceive as free, and that's you know that's what got us into this mess in the right. first place. But if um, we have an open source Harkin, then we don't need to be bothering with who's reading it. Just I want to have I any I want to jump in. And this is and this is some from the membership puzzle project, which I really recommend reading it for the layman's mm -hmm. terms. It's not some uh, uh, journal. I really hate white paper. This is not one of them, I would say, like that. Uh, but this is, blew me away was that p when you're honest with people, so let's say uh, for signups, for example, which has uh, um, a lot of the times, I mean, who hates it more than five required things, right? <laughs> Right? Who hates you know name, email, my address, phone number? You forget it, right? Yes. 
If, but if you don't ask that, if your only mandatory prompt is the name and the, ad, and the email, yeah. the statistics as to what people will give you are mind-boggling. They will <laughs> give you things that county, fucking favorite everything. comic book. They will give you everything if you don't make them give it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, really. So, so I don't know if people want to jump on that, but I think that does play into this. That and so when we do this, and this is, I'm, I've had so many thoughts today. This is, um, and I will send out not just my thoughts, but like all the <laughs> URLs and stuff. <laughs> but as far as like, you know, we're, we're not when we're gonna do something like this. Like, we're not just gonna ask for your, your information. We're gonna tell you. We're not tracking. We're not doing this to you. We're not doing that to you. What other people may do, but you can give us this. So we just communicate with you on these parameters. I think that's really you know, that's a big, that's a big honesty. Isn't that a sorting though? It's like the people who give you stuff will give you more, but if you require it, then they want to, then they're just not going. Yeah, I, I, the, 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 the numbers on this are mind boggling, really. Well, yeah, I did this experiment you, with that site I was telling you about. We mm -hmm. had a thing I created it called Friend Finder. Mm -hmm. What oh. you would do was a mm -hmm. form that you would put in all the things you wanted in your friend, <laughs> and your friend. <laughs> that it would match on a percentage basis, um, like you know, 36% in line with the art and blah, blah, blah. But to sign up, all you had to do was your name and an email address. But then the second form, you could give up all this information. We were getting 9,000 of them a day in 1997. Wow. <laughs> wow. So the more information you give, the better your experience is. Yes, right. yes. I just see on Google here 412 million face, uh, friend finder networks were breached like in 2016. That's the downside. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like someone's going to take it. The downside. downside. At some point. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we're approaching quarter of four, which is when we said in the schedule we we're going to start to wrap up. So I just sort of, um, you know, like to ask people to think about what we might do as an incipient network. You know, people took all the trouble to come here and participate in a conversation. So how do we expand the virtuous circle? Some of these projects that got mentioned, obviously we're gonna have this video. I, I wasn't able to take notes at the same time. I, you know, other people hopefully did, but we can go back and look at the video and stuff. Like, you know, what do, what do y'all wanna, what do y'all wanna do? I mean, I said like, we'd like to do a, a bigger conference. I mean, that's part of it, but then there's some projects that we could do or plug into. What I mean, do people think? At least a follow-up meeting, I kind of was wondering, you know, if we could do that or sure. even a standing regular meeting or something. I mean, the first thing that kind of came up was just like, I don't know, it was Felicia, I think we were talking about just, or somebody was talking about like the libraries or something, you know, like, I wonder if we could have like a regular like space where we like, I don't know, we met at, you know, we meet quarterly or something, like as a group or something. Yes. Um, Good so friends with the Girl Hall Project. Project. It should be the local awesome. portal. It should be the local portal. That and the URL list, that's all I'd like to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get that together. Emma! Yeah, I was listening to all the tech stuff, you know, because being one of the tech guys here, like a few of the others, um, and what it sounded like to me, what you guys were in the end really looking at was you want a website, uh, but you might also want the same website that's open that multiple organizations like from DIG to Cambridge A <coughs> can use that has Harkin-like features so mm -hmm. people can actually interact more. That has a federated paywall so uh, all of the sites together can, you know, especially locally can, can join in. That has all the <coughs> user capturing technology like the emailing and everything else built in, the newsletter stuff all built in, advertising management all built in, and has its own analytics instead of using Google Analytics. So Piwik, or now, what's it, uh, Matomo, I think is what they rebranded as. Um, so it's a self-hosted, but it's as good as Google Analytics. It's nice. awesome. So that that sounds like the platform that you guys are talking about wanting if you had it. It's called P-I-W-K. Yep. And I, I mean, of course we need to look at I.O. Cook there to see if there's anything even remotely working in that direction. But that does sound like the platform you guys kind of all in the end were talking about if it existed. Yeah, plus the larger level stuff, you know, yeah. an app, this kind of, you know, and then the big well, ticket sure. items. It, it also has to have the actual, you know, journalistic stuff like, you know, an editorial workflow, editorial calendar, all, all that stuff that you didn't need to mention because we already know all that's needed. Yeah, hope so. And Emma? Um, I just think that it would be really awesome if there was more content created kind of about these issues, like in a general way, where the public can really get in on it. Because, like, mm. I'm wondering, like, how much, if you posted anything on Cambridge Day, any articles <laughs> about, like, how Facebook is screwing you, like, do people, like, get the context of, like, what kind of environment that you're working in? Because we talk about it on our stuff, but we're kind of we more, do. like, youth oriented or, like, radical, I don't know, um, type of network. But that's, it'd be awesome to have just, like, some, some information that we could, like, share. That would 
come in to describe more of like the bigger context of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that people understand like when they come to Cambridge Day, like it's not just some random like website. It's like doing that is like an important decision that you make and you're part of this. You it's know, a product of the discussion that we have are having here and like Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like just people understand the context of their choices, like kinda of what you were saying about, you know. I'm not going to be a part of Facebook. I think people really don't know like how bad it is. Like the re regular person, they're like, "Oh, there's algorithms on Facebook. I had no idea." Like people are like, oh, "I love know. the dick stuff." But like, "Oh, oh why don't I ever <coughs> see it?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just right. don't know. So like, and here's maybe my just password. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> like we we can create that content too, but you know we're just not we're not like journalists. So whenever we say stuff, you know we just don't have the. We kind of are. I mean, yeah, I, mean we, we can write about I don't actually have a journalism stuff. degree, really. I, <laughs> <laughs> I taught journalism. Just like, <laughs> just, right, but it would just be cool. You know, I just think that would be awesome to have some help with that. One reason I think that sharing would be, the ability to share would be great is, uh, so my favorite website is NewYorkMagazines.com, huh. <laughs> NY.com, NY mm -hmm. uh, and I've never seen, I can't remember ever seeing anything they do on Twitter, on mm -hmm. Facebook. I'm yeah. on that site all the time because <laughs> they post stuff very frequently and it's always entertaining. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like they're just, I mean, it coincidentally it has a great mix of stuff that I care about. Um, Do you give them money? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, Sorry. I, <laughs> does he have money to give them money? <laughs> uh, I look at their ads, of course. Not a lot of it speaks to me, but um, for instance, uh, they do these buy these products things, and I bought a product through them. Mm -hmm. um, so I contributed minimally. <laughs> but, <laughs> they got you. But, <laughs> but having a robust homepage, <coughs> you know that homepages these days are not where it's at, right. except mm -hmm. I'm on this site all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if we can all do that, <laughs> because we always are posting things and people always have something new to find on the site that appeals to them. Well, there are things like Repub Hub that, you know, this is, and this is the kind of thing that we, I was saying uh, I think to Rachel outside is that, you know, there are little things that people, and that people in this room understand that do, uh, do any of us have an extra two hours, besides the two or three hours that we sat here today. So like there's things like Repub Hub where um, we could actually have where when you're on the Diggs website, you see Cambridge Day, Dorchester Reporter, Bay State Band nice. over here. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, I, don't think that's it. I don't know where. I think, oh, they done? Really? Okay, yeah. forget it. Another one out of business. What? A I guess we pop up is done. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if you look at, I think, like, sites like, sites like Vox and, and Mike do similar things. They have a affiliate or a lot of Yeah, exactly. Other right? like, yeah. guys are going to do it. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. so like, that's that sort of thing. Like, these are our. Our neighbors, our people, are, mm -hmm. our community. Someone yeah. just told me they want to bring back the web ring. I, I thought that yeah. was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I see the old great. folks. Yeah. 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 Could that we send a list of the yeah, it is. history yeah. from today? The links that we've gone to? Yeah, I got, I, I just got it. Too. I'll, I can send my history, too. Oh, yeah, Jake, just your history. Oh, just yeah. Yeah. Jump in whenever you can. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, for anyone who really wanted the like super just actual info about like what other alternatives are there for content distribution outside of Facebook, mm -hmm. and also to Greg's really important point of capturing the audience once they arrive on your site into channels where you can reach them not through what we think of as a platform, uh, that's an event that is on a list of maybe two dozen events that I'm thinking about doing sometime three to five months out from now. Um, please exchange your contact info with me. I'd be happy to let you know when that's happening. It helps me a lot in prioritizing which events that I'm going to be doing. Uh, and I'll probably need some guinea, big, guinea pigs to test this kind of like info in ahead of time. So you don't necessarily have to wait three months for it. Too. Could one of you share maybe, if everyone's okay with it, everyone's email addresses? Oh, sure. On a, in an email? Yeah, I can set up, set up a list too if people listserv? want. Yeah, we should because do it on uh, Rise Up or something or what? Yeah. That would be wonderful. And I'll show, I would just show you want reading habits for that too, <laughs> 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 Just your name just your and email. Social security number. Please, yes, everything. Only yes. if you want. Um, and then I, we have on, if you go to bingebox.org, I showed some of you earlier, there is a thing that has, um, well, there's a bunch of, in the extras, there's a thing on media conferences. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. okay. mm -hmm. Very cool. Every single one, nice. pretty much. Nice. Check it out couple in Boston, including, so there's a lot of action happening, and 
I go to one every month. So is that Everybody. a different side of yours, or it's just a? Page this is not. This is this. Is, uh, so we have a, there's, a, there's about eight binges now. Only one other one is called binge in Baltimore. Oh, right. Santa Fe. <laughs> so there's a lot of cities. Uh, the latest is Salt Lake City. Um, which already raised more than money than us. Oh, uh, I don't know that. They're all using oh. binge in a box. Well, the system. So, and we're helping yeah. start Winge yeah. in Western Mass. 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 So basically, uh, Winge, that's yeah. Yeah. Um, but basically, so this is this is everything we've done. So like there, uh, there'll be a whole thing about today in there. Uh, but it's okay. ma mainly it's really not direct to. I mean, anyone can look at the thing. It's bingebox.org. But uh, but it's really you know it's it's because we don't want to keep clogging up our regular. It's just bingebox.org, but yeah, this I'll, I'll definitely send. Yeah, we need to put together all the like links and stuff, and we can um, use I'll be happily doing the links <laughs> later on. Trust me. Um, and uh, who else? We got a couple minutes left. Anybody else? Could? Well, you know, it seems the other. So there was there was the tech conversation. There was the driving audience conversation. Um, but there definitely was a conversation about business model and funding and sort of you know. <laughs> Getting paid, yep. right? Like so, and, and that there are multiple models for that, multiple ways to do that. Somewhat connected to the audience engagement thing, but then there was also like audience engagement conversation, or community building, or building the reader, or like this, you know, like there's models for that too. So those are like separate from like the kind of the tech, the tech mm -hmm. conversation, and the aware, like the awareness that Emily was talking about, like building awareness of these issues, which is also kind of a policy, mm -hmm. um, kind of, and, you know, what uh, Jane was saying about regulation and stuff too, which so that, but. Those were the conversations I also heard kind of happening here too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think education is just huge. Mm -hmm. and yep. I mean, Especially just, yeah, I mean, the, I, I do something on media surveillance and, and um, you know, social media and, and my students who, I mean, they're 18 to 22, they have absolutely no idea about mm -hmm. the way they're being tracked, they have, mm -hmm. No idea. I mean, and, and you know, I think we have to be really aware as well when we're talking about Facebook and social media. That is the only way my students ever encounter news. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that when we think about let's move <coughs> off these places, we've got to be thinking about other ways of, of getting them that information mm -hmm. because whatever limited information mm -hmm. they have about the world, that is where they've gotten it as well. And so there are media literacy questions that we have to be thinking about, and we have to think about building news habits and um, you know media literacy habits as well. And that probably starts before I get them. High school, yeah, uh, if not earlier. Yeah, yeah well, there is definitely. A, you know, there's some legislation that's supposed to be voted on. There's a movement across the country yeah. to have media literacy be required. Wow. So every history is required, too, when they haven't learned <laughs> anything either. Well, there, yeah. Anyway, but there is, a, there is a thing called media literacy now, and there are three or four bills um, here that are being considered. And again, it will be take a bunch of years yeah. to really happen. But it's required in two or three states now across the U.S., which is... Better than it was. There's also it? there's also legislation I think that's passed or is passing in Massachusetts where it's a combination of news literacy and civics education that mm -hmm. recently passed or is it? Is yeah, passing. so it's like a slow, it's a baby step in yeah. the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but who's for Richard of media literacy and civic education? <laughs> yes. Well, no, yeah, I no. agree. The I Democratic agree, so Party it's probably. It's quite watered yeah. down. It's quite depoliticized, but it's you know they're not reading Howard's in. <coughs> But it's still better than it's better. It's like a place to start, and I mean, it's one. It's one of a million fronts Baby that we all have to be fighting. You know, you know it's one little thing we do to 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 get into with us is, is we we put either full or half articles on Instagram. There's still no. Li I don't. I still think there's still no well, word limit where if there which is, is. Which is ridiculous. Facebook, of course, right? It's <laughs> thousands of well, I, it's, no, no, but I, but I, well, I I'm, that's not the discussion. I'm talking about I'm getting sure. in front of that audience. I mean, oh, Instagram I is for people Instagram. who don't read. Yeah. It's for a, you know, for not not people who can't read. People visual. Who don't, it <laughs> visual culture. It's, it's, it's an idiot social media network, and but there's still people there. Well, <laughs> so it is. Say that to the photojournalist. <laughs> like me. Right. Yeah. yeah. Never, 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 never. I, I love Instagram, <laughs> but my point is that you know if we can get some eyeballs there on even if it's just what the story is about, um, you know, and if you're good, if, which we don't do this as much as we should, is you know you change the link, you change the the file. But I don't want to get specifics of it. But my point is that you know we still love putting the paper out this and that. But there are ways and. Um, you know, frankly, I know there. You can go do uh, uh, seminars on how to use Snapchat for news, but you know, 
there's a big learning curve there, and I, I don't know if it's always worth it. But yeah. is Pinterest big? Pinterest is like the what the third biggest social media network after YouTube. And Those are the crafters. Fourth, fourth, yeah. Fourth yeah. biggest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. We have a, you put you put all our stuff on. Pinterest. I put all our stuff on six different social media, including yeah. Pinterest. I think that's, which, I think that's we didn't talk about that. I know we don't have much time, but right. when you were talking, you use Buffer or something. Yeah. What did we bet, use Buffer? I, what you use? Well, you said six. So I was well, like, and I it you just and that. So, yeah. I have to do all kinds yeah. of facts. I just want to hear Matt talk about this real quick because. I know to some of you there's not much of a learning curve here, but the, what's the difference between for the like Mark and I, um, use having scripts that do it all and, and advantages or using something like yeah. So there's some scripts that we have that you can basically use. You you, you publish your own, on your own site using you know WordPress or what have you, and then it basically take it's a plugin and it takes you put in all the different sites you have like you put in your your Facebook account, your Instagram account, your Twitter account, whatever, and it supports. As you haven't even heard of these obscure networks that are out there in other countries too, mm -hmm. but you literally have it and you hit that publish button and it goes and it posts you can't every single right? one of those things. And you can customize, oh, yeah. yeah, like what it publishes. So, for, I mean, I was thinking about this a little bit this whole thing, dirty old Boston, right? If you could post on Facebook, we need to do that with but that. like have it where there was like, oh hey, <laughs> uh, a day earlier on a, on a website, mm -hmm. on Facebook, to do that with them, or yeah. like you can click through to a link and you see for more pictures or Absolutely. a high resolution or what have you. But then this notion of like being the person <coughs> who shares it and having your name on it, like there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a tech site called Linux, Linux Weekly News, LWN, and it's like four bucks a month. So they have some things that you can only see if you pay. Most things are published for free. Mm -hmm. When you share the link on of your, of, as a subscriber to somebody else, your name is right at the top. Like mm. Jason shared this, and it's mm -hmm. like, and it's you know, like it's very prominent. Like you're doing this mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah. Um, I I think figure we might as well wrap up and just continue kibitzing afterwards. Um, I'll, I guess I'll turn the camera back on. I just want to thank um everybody for coming and um, uh, Cambridge Community Television, you know, for for hosting us here, and for uh, you know all the participating organizations that are here and individuals. Uh, I'll just sort of, and for the pizza from Agaric, <laughs> thank you Agaric for pizza. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to, I guess, uh, keep moving forward with this conversation and try to expand it out and broaden it. Um, and I thank you all for coming. So. Well, thank you. What a great group. Thank you so much for coming. Now I'm going to turn off the stream. Bye, people.